Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do. It's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. All right, good evening, everybody. Let's get these puppies working. There they go. Uh, good evening. Welcome to our Tuesday, November 16th, Sioux Falls City Council meeting. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll go ahead and get started by reading our roll, please. Council Member Starr. Here. Brecky. Here. Erickson. Here. Jensen. Here. Kylie. Here. Neitzert. Here. Selberg. Here. Sale. Here. All right, our invocator couldn't make it tonight, so I'm going to call on uh, Councillor Jensen to give the invocation tonight. So I'd ask that you rise for that and then uh, stay standing for our Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Dear God, thanks for bringing us together tonight to conduct the city's business. Be with everyone up here as they make decisions and be with our uh, public here as they come and give us great public, concise uh, input. Uh, in your name we pray, amen. Amen. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right, I'd ask the folks from uh, USA Softball Association of South Dakota if you'd come on up to the front. We have a special presentation to make tonight. We're here tonight for uh, when we went to Oklahoma City to our an, uh, annual convention uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we got a pleasant surprise, and that Sherman Park in Sioux Falls was named USA Softball Complex of the Year. Uh, this is <laughs> they, they name one a year, and uh, it's, it's quite an honor. Uh, I've played out here for. A long time since 1974, coached, umpired. Um, we've always known it's the shining uh, complex in South Dakota. To find out that it's also the shining complex in the United States is fantastic. I'll just read one quick thing from our national office. On behalf of all of USA Softball, congratulations to Sherman Park for earning the 2021 USA Softball Complex of the Year. This is from Rich Crest of Membership Services. Sherman Park does an outstanding job of maintaining their facility create a fun, safe, and pleasant family environment. Whether it's USA Softball National Championships or local events, the Sherman Park staff take great pride in what they do, and it shows both and on, on and off the field. They're right over there, folks. They do a great job. <laughs> and, uh, the, last, the last one we want to thank is you and the council, present and past, uh, to have the vision to go ahead and supply these guys with the equipment to make this place what it is. Thank you. You want to introduce your members too here so we can uh, sure. honor them as well? Okay. At the end is Jerry Bills. He's representing Sioux Falls People for Youth, our, our Youth Fast Pitch, and Steve Riswall, our UIC, Carol Pipgrass, our Youth Commissioner. And I'm Gary Young from Watertown, our State Commissioner. All right. Well, Jerry, uh, team, thanks for uh, coming tonight and uh, letting the community know about this honor. I got to give a big shout out to our Parks and Rec team because they do do an incredible job with that park as well. Uh, our tourism group is here, Terry Ellis Schmidt. She knows what softball means to our community. We host a lot of softball events, and it's, we've become a, a known entity in the softball world as a great place to hold tournaments and hold events. And it's thanks to your work, thanks to your leadership. So thanks for all you do to make us a great city for softball. Okay, I personally want to say thank you to the Park and Rec, all of the Park and Rec, for all of the field maintenance that we receive from each and every one of you guys, from the past to the present. We could not do it without you. We hear all the time when teams come in from all across the nation what a fantastic place it is to play ball, and it's a lot because of you guys. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We do truly appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you, guys.
Uh, Don Carney, did he? Try? Okay, he tried to sneak out. You'll accept the award on behalf of the team, and uh, yeah. Don's our Parks and Rec director. Don, thanks for all your work with uh, with the team. So we'll grab a photo and then we'll move on. So let's uh, let's get in here like we love each other. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. All right, we'll move on now to our next item. It's item five. It's our consent agenda. Councilors, any changes to be made there? Move approval. Give me just a second. Second, Jensen. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Jensen. Councilor Starr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to uh, pull item number, uh, sub item 18 from agenda item seven. And then also I have one of the uh, uh, retail uh, or the uh, liquor licenses in item 12 that I'd like to discuss. All right. Any other changes to be made before we vote on this? All right. Hearing none, let's take a vote then, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right. That passes 7 to 0. We'll move on to our uh, regular agenda, item 20. I'll look for a motion there, please. Move to approve. Sale. Second. Jensen. Okay. Motion by sale. Seconded by Jensen. Councilor Sale. The motion to amend by placing item 40 before item 21 and item 46 after item 29. Second. Jensen. All right. Motion by Councilor Sale. Seconded by Councilor Jensen uh, to rearrange those items. Let's take a vote on that, please. Council Member Starr. Yes. Brecky. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Jensen. Yes. Kylie. Neitzert. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Sale. Yes. All right. That passes seven to zero. Main motion as amended now. Is there any other amendments to make? All right. Let's vote on that then, please. Council Member Starr. Yes. Brecky. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Jensen. Yes. Kylie. Neitzert. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Sale. Yes. All right. That passes seven to zero. Before we move on with our meeting, just a reminder how public input works for our meetings. Uh, for any item that we're uh, reviewing, comments are limited to three minutes unless it's for final adoption. In that case, uh, public input comments are limited to five minutes. Uh, items are also limited to the agenda item under consideration only for the comments. And at the end of the meeting, at general public input, uh, people will be allowed three minutes per person for input. So with that being said, we'll start with uh, the items pulled from consent. First is pull consent uh, item sub-item 18. And that's uh, project description or department health project description agreement to provide process and impact evaluation of the city COVID-19 vaccination efforts. Vendor University of South Dakota amount not to exceed $23,863. $23, Easy. <laughs> Easy, Tom. <laughs> Councilor Starr. That got everyone's attention. I didn't, I, there you are, Dr. Chima. I saw you a minute ago and then I didn't, I lost it. Give, it, give us just an idea of what we're trying to accomplish with this contract and how it fits with the other research that we're doing and and where we're at. Yeah, sure. So thank you. Um, Pull those apart, though. If you put them together, the two microphones. Right? Okay. Pull them together. Yeah, they'll get feedback downstairs. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles Chima, Public Health Director. Uh, <laughs> so as you are aware, we've been in the past uh, three months intensifying our efforts to engage with the community to see what we can do to improve our COVID vaccination rates. Uh, so when we started these new efforts, we were around 50% of the population was uh, had, had received at least one dose of the vaccine. So part of our strategy is try to be evidence-based to really understand the reasons why those that have not gotten the vaccine are still, you know, uh, holding back. So the other study we had done had helped us learn issues around complacency, uh, you know, convenience and um, and confidence. Essentially, the, what's going on is that the people for whom timing and availability of the vac I know the scheduling still remain a barrier for them. But there are those who don't have a problem accessing the vaccine in terms of scheduling. But they have uh, they just 
lack the confidence uh, you know, and the trust in the system to believe that it's the right decision for them to make at this time. And there's a lot of reason behind that. So what we've learned from the studies we've done have informed our current efforts where we're doing mobile clinics, we're doing employer-based events, we're having physicians engage one-on-one uh, -on -one with people uh, who want to learn more about, understand why it's important to get a vaccine and address the questions that they have. So everything we're doing is based on what we are learning. This new effort with USD is to evaluate uh, you know, the activities as a whole to see if what is working, what is not working. Because part of what we say is that those that are motivated are really super motivated. So you have people coming for their, you know, for their booster doses. But then we're still struggling with getting those who need to get their first dose. And that's really where our effort is, is kind of focused on, is trying to get people to get their first dose with those who haven't started the series. So this is really to give us the information we need uh, to understand what's working. So we're trying so many things. We're doing one-on-one -on -one outreach uh, at, for patients at Force Community Health. We're doing employer-based events. We're doing home-based vaccinations even for those who are homebound. And all of the strategies, you know, have different rates of success and uh, have, you know, reaching different populations. So this is to help us uh, get the data we need to make better uh, data-informed decisions. One of the things we've seen in the news this week is there's now four states, starting with, I believe it was Colorado, that are saying that everyone should get a booster, that there shouldn't be that part of it. Do you see us as a city making that pitch to, to our citizens that, that we need to uh, go ahead with the booster shots for everyone? I think that uh, the general direction the scientific community is moving. So my understanding right now, the Pfizer uh, has a presentation to CDC to consider approving uh, the boosters for everyone, irrespective of under, underlying chronic disease or not. Uh, so I think that's the direction the scientific community is moving. And over time, it's likely that will become the consensus that everyone and every adult is encouraged to get the booster because it's seen that over time, the efficacy wins a bit. And when you get the booster, it restores the efficacy of the vaccine. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Dr. Shima? All right. Look for a motion on this item. Move to approve. Star. Second, Jensen. All right. Motion by Star. Seconded by Jensen. Uh, discussion here. All right. Let's take a vote, please. Council Member Star. Yes. Brecky. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Jensen. Yes. Kylie. Yes. Neitzer. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Sale. Yes. All right. That passes 8-0. Next item. Uh, the next item, just for a clarification, Councillor Starr, the first item on the exhibit. Um, no, actually, it is for DCK LLC Davids at 212 West 10th Street. Which one is that one? Uh, <coughs> one second there, just young that, man. It's right here. All right, let's take a vote, please. Yeah, Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Uh, this one, Council Member, the one that I have highlighted? Yes. Okay. 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 You want to speak to that, Councillor Starr? Yeah, actually, I just had a few questions for the uh, applicant, if I could. So. All right. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Uh, I'm Todd. I'm the general manager for Club David. Okay. Could you... Could you go through your security plan a little bit for me? Because that'll follow up with a, a question. So one of the things as part of your license, you have a security plan, obviously. How okay. is it enforced and what is the, the security plan that you have in place? Okay, when we have events and even our bartenders, we do have a, a door person that takes care of, she cards everybody that comes in the door. Uh, she doesn't care if you're 40, 50, she'll card everybody. Uh, she'll even make sure that your ID isn't expired. If it's expired, she won't even accept that ID either. Uh, for We've had, like, the DJ's mom. She wouldn't even let him in, her in because she doesn't have an ID. She's very, and she's been with the company for about 35 years. Okay. And the bartenders know to card everybody also. We haven't had any issues for undercover stains or anything along that line. Well, and I guess that's why I was concerned when I saw the media reports back in uh, the middle or the end of September, around the 20th of September, and the headline was police investigating fights or fight between teens at a downtown Sioux Falls bar. And when, I apologize, it, it's, it's a brief story, but it was very concerning. Um, 
And According to the story on Kello, it says Sioux Falls police are investigating an assault at a bar in downtown Sioux Falls where several teens were hurt. Police say it happened around 1.15 Sunday morning at a bar near 10th and Dakota in downtown Sioux Falls. A 15, a 16 year old boy and a 17 year old girl were inside when a fight started between two other people. Police say one of them pulled out a gun and started hitting the teens. Police say one teen had to have stitches and another had a broken bone um, after getting hit in the face. All three were from Minnesota and police say that they, they're looking for the suspect. They're also trying to figure out why the teens were in the bar. And okay. that's how the story ends. So again, I have the media report. That's the best I have. So help me out. Tell me, tell me how this happened. Uh, one of the detectives reached out to me from the Sioux Falls Police Department and we worked with him closely. And the uh, people that got into the bar, they did not come in the main entrance. They were not carted by our person. The person that was hosting the event, the DJ, let them in the side door at the bar and put wristbands on them because our bartenders look for the wristbands. If they have a wristband, they're 21, they've been carted. And since then, we have hired a security person just to monitor that side door because it's a fire escape door, so we cannot keep it locked. And the detective, that was my main concern too when everything happened. I said, how did they get in the bar? And uh, people told the detective that their friends let them in the side door. So it has nothing to do with our policies about IDing people because we follow our policies closely. Thank you. Thanks. I just follow. Yeah, I just had a question. We asked someone from the, or I asked someone from the police department to come. So I want to get an, at least their answer to the same question that the media was asking. And we sent any surveillance videos or anything we had over to the detective already too. I believe he contacted me on September 21st, it was, or I talked with him, and the incident happened the morning of September 19th. Gotcha. All Thank right. you. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Kevin, you want to come up as well? This, this Kevin. Sorry. Too many Kevins. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, uh, Lieutenant Kevin Henkel, night shift lieutenant for the police department. Thank you, Lieutenant. And I guess that's that's my main question is, is the only way I found out about this was the media report. Um, and I guess I have the same question that the, the media did is that how did this happen and how do we make sure that it doesn't happen again? You know, it's one thing when we see people fight in bars and it's not a good thing. But at the same time, when we start seeing people as young as 15 um, that got into a bar and does it happen on a regular basis? And is this a ongoing occurrence. So we're a couple months down the road since this happened. So give me an idea how we feel comfortable that this is going to be taken care of. I think uh, uh, obviously that's, it was disappointing to us to hear about the, uh, the ages that were involved. Um, there's a certain <coughs> amount of uh, trust you put in uh, to the bars downtown to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, when we looked into this incident, um, the stories that we were given by the juveniles was that uh, they traveled quite a ways to get here for this thing, and they knew they were going to get in because of the person working with the, the entertainment. Um, to keep it from happening uh, again, uh, we have done compliance check at, at that establishment, and they did pass um, again, carded the uh, informant that we had used and did not serve him. Um, going forward, you know, we'll continue to watch uh, and look for incidents like that. Um, overall, uh, the number of calls at the, the uh, bar itself uh, average about 30 a year. Right now, they're at 31 for the year, so not outrageous. Um, and when I went through the each call last night that was at um, there, a majority of them don't involve fights. Uh, only one involved juveniles. And um, I'm hearing tonight that they've hired extra security um, and that side door, and hopefully they don't use that same entertainment venue again or person. Um, leaves me to believe they're taking steps to address <coughs> and not let it happen again. As part of the renewal 
process becomes kind of routine for us if they don't have a compliance failure or there isn't a, a media story like this. How do, how do we know that they're updating their security plan on a regular basis? Because this is one that maybe they could have seen that coming, maybe they couldn't. I, I understand people are, you know, I was a teen too, we were sneaky as, as all get out by the time we were done, but do we have a process that we continually, you know, they, have, they give us their security plan at the beginning when they get a license, but do we update it each time or do we help them move along with that process? So it might be a question for Jamie, I'm not sure. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. All right. Any other questions on this item, Council? I'm done. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, can I get a motion for this item? Move approval. Jensen. Okay. Second. Sale. All right. Motion by Jensen. Seconded by Sale. Any discussion here? Let's vote on that, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that one passes eight to zero. Next item, please. The next item is item number 40, deferred from the meeting of Tuesday, November 9th, 2021, a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls approving the preliminary plan of 41 Ellis edition, 14832-2021. The Planning Commission recommends approval of six to zero, private applicant, 41 Ellis, LLC. Good evening, Jason. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council. Jason Bieber representing Planning and Development Services. Uh, this is a preliminary subdivision plan for 41st and Ellis that we've seen three times so far, so I'll be a little bit more brief tonight. Uh, the applicant and owner here is Brady Hyde. Uh, as indicated, it's located west of South Ellis Road and south of West 41st Street. Uh, the purpose of this preliminary subdivision plan is the applicant is looking to construct single family townhome and apartment residential uses on the um, 44 acres. Uh, this was the initial preliminary subdivision plan that was presented at first reading. At that time, we had some concerns from the West property owners, the clients about the uh, entire road being on their property. Uh, as part of that, we went to the applicant and he then changed um, South Ronzik Avenue to go entirely on his property. Uh, we still had concerns from the uh, neighbors that uh, the collector street should go down uh, the property line straight south and straddle both subdivisions. As we've indicated before, this does meet those minimum requirements of the subdivision ordinance as uh, in our subdivision, uh, preliminary subdivision section of that. And I do have uh, city engineer Andy Berg here if you have specific engineering questions and the applicant and also the property owners are also here tonight. All right, thanks Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on this item tonight? Come on up. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Tenhaken, Ten Haken, member, members of the council. I'm Damian Grebel, Earhart Griffin and Associates, uh, 601 North Minnesota Avenue, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Um, as uh, Jason just stated, we do have a subdivision process. And I'm oh, sorry if I could get the overhead. And uh, generally, as you know, we're right here in the rezoning process. It clearly states the process should be a, an approved preliminary plan. Then you can move on to development engineering plans, which sets you up for construction plans. Any deviance from this order is a complete at risk by the developer. So if you were to uh, advance in grading or construction or pull any permits without a preliminary plan approved, this is completely at risk. City staff tells any applicants this, that if you know you're jumping the gun on this, it's at your risk. Uh, without an approved preliminary plan. And that's what we're here to discuss tonight. Um, we believe, again, that there are, I guess, two prongs on how preliminary subdivisions or subdivisions are developed in the city. There's your subdivision ordinance, as well as your engineering design standards. Two covered, uh, two basic things. The engineering design standards will tell you how to build the roads. Engineering or your subdivision ordinance tells you where to place the roads. It's clearly stated here in your ordinance that the location of major streets tell conform to the official major street plan. Again, here's your major street plan that shows a road in between the client property and the 41 Ellis addition property. The ordinance also states that if this has to deviate from this location, the landowners may have to negotiate with adjacent landowners, the developer negotiate with the landowners, or government entities. They have to negotiate if this develops. They have to communicate if this is to be deviated from. And the last part of your subdivision ordinance states clearly 
that Collector Street shall be developed along or between adjoining property lines so that both can share in the cost as well as access to the Collector Street. We believe this is in black and white in your subdivision ordinance. Um, prior to this approval, uh, city staff had informed us that they had had a pre-application meeting with the developer. The reason that this made this to planning commission is that city staff informed the developer to contact the clients, contact that adjacent property owner to let them know that this property or this road was gonna be pushed onto their property. It was not try to, it was inform this property owner that this was going to happen. This did not happen. As you know, this was stated that property owner was not contacted. That's the only reason we didn't make it to planning commission to object to this preliminary plan. It's very easy to contact this property owner. If you were to Google or go onto the Minnehaha County website, you would see here's the property owner address. The address for the home address is the property owner address right across the street from the property. We do not think it's difficult to get a hold of this property owner. Um, by approving this plan, we feel that there is a loss of property in a, a, a development the way we could develop it. 40 feet goes on one side of the street, 40 feet goes onto the other. If this is deviated either way, if we have to build a full road, we lose 40 feet of property to develop on. We also lose access points. We, we want the ability to be able to have full access to a lighted intersection for any way that we develop. If we want a 400 foot long property along this line, if we want anything else, that's the flexibility that we are looking for on our side of the road. We, we do not want to lose that and we want the ability to do anything we can along this road. Um, as stated before, these, develop, these landowners are ready to develop. They do not want to hold anybody up. They do want to work with this property owner to cost share in this road on the adjacent property line. As the developer stated, he will be starting in this location on the east side of the property. He, he needs an access, he needs access to here. So what he presented and got approved was pushing the road onto the clients and still reserving a 20 foot or some type of access at this point. He didn't inform the clients and he didn't ask them about that. What we want to do is be able to develop this property together in any type of phase that is needed. So if Brady if, or if the Empire would need 100 feet of road, we would, we would help in that. If they need 300 feet of road, we would help in that. We're more than willing to work with this developer on the development of this, of this road at this access point along the adjacent property owners. I thank you for your time. Boom, four seconds. I would ask <laughs> any questions. Well, now you just went over three <laughs> seconds, so. <laughs> Thanks, Damien. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else here to speak on this item? Please come up. Good evening. Hello, I'm David Zafkaitis, and I like to look at city issues. So I looked at this one, and my PowerPoint, there it is. All right, so. There's the issue, and let's go and take a look and see what I figured out. For background, we, need, we should note that construction's a big deal in Sioux Falls, billion dollar annual industry. And we need to encourage this kind of industry because you know it's economic driver and really helps the city out. But we need to be careful that city government doesn't, doesn't really, really, really like developers. That might be too much. Now, the, the issue here is that we're, going to rezone some property by South Ellis Road, and there is some question as to where the new Collector Street should go. I happened to read the city ordinance about it, and there it is right there. It says, collectors shall be developed along or between property lines. It says, the collector. It doesn't say a little piece of the collector. It says, the collector. That's an important note. And here's the development plan that we saw last week. I added that yellow highlighter. It shows that the Collector Street starts off near the property line, and then it takes a hike off to the side. Now, some of the comments we heard last week uh, kind of give me the impression that City Council would vote for the plan that we just saw. Um, if you have a need, critical need of housing and got to get things done now, it kind of implies that you would be willing to go with the plan that we just saw. We have a legal precedent for not quite doing things right, and that's at McKennett Park. 
somebody built a giant house that uh, was too, too big, wrong style, and the city approved it, but it was struck down by the courts, and then they had to take it out, fix the mess. We really don't need that kind of problem to recur. So I have some recommendations, and they are that we should follow the city ordinance, put the whole collector street where it belongs, and check access requirements along the other borders of the property just to be thorough, and we could avoid some costly litigation. And then the Planning Commission really should know what they're doing and not pass stuff like this in the first place. And with that, good evening, everybody. All right, thank you. Anyone else here to speak on uh, item 40 tonight? Come on up. Dunlap Good evening. Real Estate. I didn't even know this clock was here the last time. It's yeah, there, so Rick. Nervous. <laughs> I know This will be a little easier tonight because we're going to talk about something that I know. It's about money. Is uh, what we're going to be talking about is the boundary line, 40-foot easement. This doesn't go on the quarter line. Is yes. the developer to the east? He's going to gain 40 feet of right away. It's a quarter mile long, so that's 52,800 square feet. If you look in his development plans, most of his fourplex lots are 118 by 119. So each of those lots is 14,042 square feet. If you take the total distance square feet, he's picking up by not putting this road in. 3.76 fourplex lots. So I've already started marking this property. As we've indicated, we're going to develop it. So I have to work the clients out of this property. I contacted some builders. Uh, of course, I work a lot with equity homes, so I know what single-family lots and twin homes are. I had no idea what a fourplex lot, so I started calling. I had one builder said he'd take them all for 100000 He seemed pretty anxious. So I called another builder, and he said that he, if on the open market, you could potentially sell those for 115 to 120,000 a piece. So I don't want to inflate these numbers. I could come up here and put stuff up here. I want to make these numbers legit. So at 100,000, if he picks up 3.6 lots by not putting in that road, that's a gain of $376,000 just in land. So now just recently, right across the street, we did Dolores Avenue, exactly a quarter mile long. Every road can be different. And so I put a general price range of 520 to 640 feet, running feet. How much storm sewer do you have? Do you have to put fiber in the road? We just finished Dolores, and that cost us $636 per foot, a quarter mile of it. So now if you take the 1320, and I do a low of 520, that's $686,400. Got to divide that by half, because if it was on the section line, you'd each pay half. That's a saving at that number of 343200 If you figure the high number, which I believe is actually low, that's 422400000 So by not putting this road on the section line, that's a gain to 41st Street Ellis of between $719,000 and $798,000. That's a loss to the clients. They're going to lose 40 feet. They're going to have to put a whole road in. What about the loss of property value of live work on a commercial corner there if we have full access? What about value lost to the landowners to the south and southwest? There's a property, Lammers Edition just got annexed in. The whole road would be dumped on them instead of on their quarter line. What about them? I believe, it's my opinion, this document, whoever wrote it, is a very smart person. If you actually read it, this was made to stop what's going on here. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Come on up. Good evening. My name, my name is Sam Goodhope. I represent the Klein brothers and sisters. Um, just to be clear, my clients were never contacted by uh, Mr. Hyde in this case. Um, 
we did finally receive an offer at three o'clock today from his attorney. But I think what this goes to show that my clients have owned this property or their family has owned this property for 75 years. They've seen Sioux Falls creeping towards them. They fully intended to develop this property to allow uh, Mr. Hyde to develop the property in such a way as to move the collector street onto his property, it saves him between seven and $800,000, but it costs them. And that's what we're asking you to deny is um, they have as much right to develop their property along the guidelines that are laid out in the ordinance as Mr. Hyde does. We're not trying to hold anybody back. We're not trying to hold anybody hostage. Uh, if we had been contacted by Mr. Hyde early on, we would have told him just what we've laid out. And we're asking the council to deny um, this motion that's proposed and to send it back to planning so that it can be laid out according to the ordinance along the property line. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Good evening. Good evening. Hello, Brady Hyde from the applicant, Empire Homes, 4615 South Tech Link Circle. So obviously we were here last week going through the same exercise. Um, a few things I guess I would like to point out in chatting with them are few questions that I would have, I guess, yeah, that I would like to pose, make sure I get this on here properly. So I guess part of my misunderstanding or my lack of understanding is I've circled Ronzik as theirs to the north. So you can see 267th Street there is 41st Street. You can see our developed there in the southeast piece of it. And the client's property there on the on the west side of Ronzik, but where that that red circle is there, that's Ronzik to the north. And where some of my confusion lies is how how the great concern comes up now when the the proposed and developers actually in, were in, in Damien and Rick were in charge of developing that. And so we're like three four hundred feet to the north, and they didn't carry Ronzik straight along the track collector, but now all the concern is based on me to do such. So I don't think that's valid. Additionally, I just want to highlight that we are meeting design standards. This is why we have city support. We haven't done anything different than any other developer does in this town. So um, yeah, I, we just want the same ability to develop just as anybody else has within the same industry standards to achieve the same risk reward that any other developer does in this town. Uh, with that said, We've heard the argument that we're denying access to utilities. I still, I don't understand that piece of it. The same exhibit shows water and sewer at two locations on the other side of 41st adjacent to client's property. They have as much access to utilities as we do. So um, that argument I don't think is valid. As far as Rick's narrative on saving 700 or $800,000, that's as imaginary as this tooth fairy. That is just simply not true. So. That, uh, yeah, I, I could craft a narrative around that um, more based on real reality, but that is not true. And we aren't, in fact, saving four to feet or 40 feet of right of way. We brought the collector onto our street. So the collectors don't have to be 80 foot right of way. They can be 60 foot right of way, depending on your zoning. They can be 66 foot right of way. Because of our zoning, we're allowed to go to a 66 foot right away. If it, say, if it was on the, the quarter mile line, that could be a 60, that could be a 66, it could be an 80. So we're not saving, we're bringing an entire road onto our property. So whether that was 30 on our feet on our side, and they're also assuming that they're, they're pr or assuming that they would get live work zoning on that corner. If we go on the quarter mile line and we, Maybe we want to do single family there. That's RS zoning. Shape places will tell you you can't put live work right up against RS zoning. So with that, their basis of lost revenue, they're assuming all best case scenarios for themselves and then working backwards into why it's so much better for us. We're simply just wanting to develop, control both sides of the road, which isn't unreasonable. 
and move forward. A um, couple other, my, my other point, I guess, was, uh, again, just that we meet the design standards. We're not taking away any accesses. There's still access on the 40, 41st via Ronzik. And, um, and then as far as us not reaching out to the, to the neighbors, that is true. We did not reach out to the neighbors. Uh, again, I don't, have, I don't have a phone book that identifies LLC contact information. But again, I've never been contacted either. Even after this last Tuesday's meeting, I reached out to city staff saying, hey, would love to get in touch with the clients. Can you share any contact information? I was unable, the information was not able to be shared with me until I received a text from Mr. Goodhope on Friday afternoon. Thank you for the text. Immediately put him in touch with our attorney, who may be speaking next, and move forward from there. But the fact remains, the, the fact that those numbers that Rick presented are, are so imaginary is why there is such a gap, and there will be a gap. And though those the ultimate outcome, in my estimations, would be if that goes on the on the uh, on the quarter mile road, is we'll end up not coming to terms with any sort of road agreement because we we're in a completely different spaces, and we'll end up absorbing absorbing the cost or a lack of development. And again. We are meeting design standards. I just want to be able to meet design standards, develop, and build, just like any other builder developer in this town. So that's my, that's my, uh, I guess my thoughts. Any questions for me? Thank you, Brady. Potentially, we'll let, you, we'll let you have a seat. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Good evening. Good evening, Sean Nichols. I'm counsel for Empire Homes, uh, 8309 South Quiet Oak Circle Trail. Um, the question that the council has with respect to a zoning issue is, is adopting the zoning request consistent with your ordinances? Jason has already answered that for you tonight, saying yes, in fact it is. Um, and I know Mr. Grebel had gone through uh, the ordinance to some degree, but um, if you look at the actual ordinance, We got it for you, man. All right. City magic. So we, we've parsed this, uh, thank you. Uh, so we parsed this ordinance apart a little bit, but nowhere in this ordinance does it indicate that uh, a collector road has to go right on the quarter section line. And in fact, if you review all of the layout of the west side of Sioux Falls, that is more the exception than the rule. Consider Ellis, or excuse me, Sertoma, for example. Um, I just went through and looked at a number of streets on the west side of town and, and very few of them are on a grid system. Uh, Sertoma being uh, a main one, Discovery being nearby, uh, 22nd Street, 32nd Street, um, Theodore, Purdue, Galloway, Grinnell, these are all streets nearby. None of them are on a grid basis uh, and I, I believe would be collector streets according to your ordinance. The two things I've heard from the people that are opposed to the ordinance uh, are one, it poses a hardship on us and again, two, that uh, the ordinance requires it to be on the quarter section line. Already covered that second issue. Nowhere in this ordinance does it say that. Uh, the second thing, uh, with respect to a hardship, I think it's important to understand what the South Dakota Supreme Court has said with respect to uh, uh, zoning issues. And that's, hey, look, you follow your ordinances first and foremost. And if it meets the ordinance, then you're in good shape. And I think if we look through this ordinance, I want to speak specifically to uh, A2, talking about hardship. It says, the arrangement of all streets and alleys shall be in such uh, as to not cause a hardship to the adjoining property owner when they plat their own land and seek to provide convenient access. Uh, it cuts off there, but that qualifier with respect to a hardship is important. Is there access being denied to the property to the west? Well, they're right on 41st Street. There's several hundred feet of roadway that abuts 41st Street where they have access to get out of their property. Um, nowhere in this uh, ordinance does it talk about utility costs uh, in the hardship uh, ordinance that I pointed out. Uh, nowhere does it talk about uh, the, you know, sharing costs uh, with respect to a hardship or you know, who gets more profit uh, as constituting a hardship. It's really, are we imposing some kind of um, new uh, restriction on the use of their land that didn't exist? And the answer to that is no. Um, 
The other thing I, I wanted to point out about the ordinance is there was reference uh, to section D. Uh, I wanted to look at D1. Uh, that specifically says that collector streets are run for three miles. And as Mr. Hyde had indicated, if you were to go north uh, on Ronzik, uh after about 300 feet, you'd run into a dead end. These are the developers that are opposed to what we're doing, didn't follow uh, what they claim the ordinance requires of us tonight. So it seems like there's some irony in that. Again, um, it's very unusual for collector streets uh, to be in a grid uh, position on the west side of town. There isn't a hardship as defined by your own ordinance here. Uh, and uh, as Jason has already indicated, the proposed zoning uh, meets the requirements of your ordinance. Uh, and I would humbly suggest that it should be approved. All right, thank you, Sean. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? All right, seeing no, okay, come on up. If anybody else is here to speak on it, pop right up when she's done and we'll keep moving, thanks. Good evening. Cindy Robinson, uh, 4608 267th Street. Thank you for listening. Um, we're the client, representing the client property owners and I, just still do not think it's fair. We are ready and more willing to pay for our half of that road. We do not want to pay for all of it if we don't have to. I just don't think that's fair. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay, Cindy, thanks. All right, uh, we're gonna move on then to uh, discussion here at the council. Council, any questions? Councilor Selberg, start with you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't know who can answer the question, but how much correspondence has gone on between the two parties in the last week? I believe that was a big reason why we did a second deferral here. I mean, it seems safe to say that not much progress has been made, so. Uh, I can just give you what, uh, what I've seen. <clears throat> Brady is correct, about 6.45 on Wednesday morning, he did send me an email requesting uh, contact information from the clients. I did not have direct contact information, so I did send that over to Mr. Dunlap asking for that. Uh, they were going to have a meeting later in that day to see how they wanted to proceed. Um, I didn't hear anything back, and then I believe they tried to contact Brady on Friday through attorneys. And then we did meet with um, representatives of the client today at 10 o'clock at City Hall. Um, not the client specific, but Mr. Dunlap, uh, Mr. Grable, and then their attorney. But the two parties have not had any face-to-face -face or correspondence or? I don't want to speak for him, but I believe it's just been through the, the two attorneys now. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilor Neisser. Um, I have a question for whoever would be the best expert on, on platting, and I'm guessing, I don't know if that's gonna be you or maybe Andy. Uh, and, and I'd like to see if you could put up the subdivision. Yeah, perfect. Um, um, if, first of all, before I forget, I, I do want to say that um, and, and, and I, I'm gonna be really clear here. I'm trying to be a neutral arbiter and follow the law. I know, I know Rick Dunlop really well. I know Brady Hyde really well, and, and we're all on good terms. And um, my job is to try to make a, a, a neutral decision and, and follow the law, and that's what I'm gonna to try to do. Um, the, the one thing I do want to throw out before I ask a question is it was mentioned the issue with Ronziac going north and, and I, I just want to throw out the caveat that I don't want to get too much into history but many years ago that stretch was going to be essentially Highway 100. It was going to be the West Side Corridor. Uh, the state was decided not to play ball. Uh, they weren't going to fund it so the city essentially gave that up and made T. Ellis Road the West Side Corridor. Um, so Ronziac originally was going to be an arterial, if I remember right. The city would have paid for it. And I think um, key re the, the Dunlops and stuff were moving forward with development based on that. And, and the city changed, and that road didn't get done. And so they had to bear the cost of doing the road, the stretch that they've done. The stretch going from where it ends going north um, has been a subject of, of litigation with the city, I believe, and it's still ongoing, I believe, and there's disputes, and I'm not sure how that road is gonna get finished. So I, I just wanna say that there's a, a big backstory to that stretch of road not getting getting done. It's not just as simple as, and there's a lot of messiness with it that's gone on for many years. Okay, so um, my question is, there was a lot of discussion um, last week about 
um, not wanting to, that we need housing and we don't want to hold up development. Um, and I, I, that's compelling, but as I was thinking about it, and this is where I, I want to just make sure that we're all very clear. If Brady goes south on, which he plans to on Broke Drive, that was going to be his main access, and he said he would start east and go west, building, right? So he, he brings the utilities down, he does all of that. He could build up to, what, 30 units, I think, before he would need a second access, correct? Yep. Okay, so, so he could do 30 units, first of all, over here, and wouldn't have to do anything over here on Ronziac with this road at all. He wouldn't have to build Ronziac at all going south. Not until he got to that phase, correct. Yeah, okay. Once he gets to over 30 units, he's got to provide at least, I believe, a fire access. Yeah, emergency. Which, yep, yeah, fire so, emergency access, correct. So it could be as simple as, could it just be just a little stretch of 40 feet, like a, 30, like, like a gravel road coming down there? On, yeah, on his if, side? If you go back to this, this, if I can go backwards here. You go back a couple. Uh, on his first plan, he kind of gives you an idea of where he would be doing. There, that yeah. blue, that yeah. would have been, if this plan would have been approved, the one he first submitted at first reading, that blue would have been his emergency fire access to get up to 41st Street, the second access. And, and, and so essentially... If he had done this plan and he built that, essentially did that right there, um, doesn't need to build any of Ronziac going up and down and he can just keep developing this whole subdivision even if the people on the west do nothing, right? It, it, and, with, and, the, and, with everything but, but lots that, that abut the, the future collector because once you plat a lot, you're gonna have, you'd have to then you have to bond and for the road. For the, for the road, but he, you, you could build this entire subdivision except for uh, this blockway here on the west, the ones that would be abutting the proposed collector, right? Yeah, he could do that last, yes, correct. Okay, so I, just to make sure it's very clear, I, I, as I was thinking about it, I, I, don't th I don't think that it's a concern that even if the other side and the other side says that they will, but even if they, they wouldn't quote unquote play ball that this development couldn't happen and that they would somehow hold up development here. I think he could develop basically the entire thing even if they didn't move at all. He could develop the majority of it, correct? Yes, okay, all right. Um, and, and so again, um, as, far, as far as where the road goes, and, and then the next question I have, and you may be able to answer this, Andy may be able to, and I kind of know the answer, but um, you could potentially, they could do it right down the middle, right? Split the property lines and both do 40 feet or whatever it would be, 80 feet, you know, if it's 80 feet or 66 feet. Uh, it's not unheard of to do, to align it over where it's all on one property line. You're saying what Brady's proposing? No, well, I mean, no, if it, it would go all the way up and down, but it would, let's say, theoretically, Brady could just build, the, build it all the way up and down his property line, carry the whole cost. Um, that's probably a question for Andy if we've done that before. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Because if it runs up and down the property line, but it's on one, all on one side, it still provides access to the other property owner in the future. Is that? You're, if you're, you're saying, sorry, Andy Burring, Public Works. Uh, if you're saying if the road, the west edge of the road was on the property line? So the, the 80 feet west of his property line, he would run the road all the way up and down there, just theoretically, rather than splitting 40-40? Yes. He could do that. They could also do 40-40. Uh, uh, you could build 40 feet, and if the other side didn't want to develop, you could just build your 40 feet, and then the other 40 feet would happen in the future whenever they platted. And the annex. We, yeah, we do have a half street policy in place that dictates how they can do that, yes. Or a property owner could talk to the other side and say, hey, I'll build it um, and we'll come to a private agreement. They do that, a development agreement where when you come in, if you sell your property or whatever, that's the trigger in which you have to pay me back. You could do, they do that, developers do that. Private agreement, yes, for okay. the funding, yep. So there's a lot of ways in which you could potentially do that road up and up and down there. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Councilor Brackey. Um, question for Jason. Um, 
I, I keep hearing over and over it said that that we are meeting all the design standards, but then we're confronted with two ordinances, one that requires that collector streets shall be developed along the property line. And the other one that says if they're not, they, they, there's an obligation to negotiate. How, how does that work? How can they be meeting all design standards and, contra and still be contradictory to the plain language of the ordinances? Is so, it because it's a different chapter that the subdivision's in? Yeah, our interpretation and engineer, I don't want to speak for them, but interpretation of that subdivision ordinance, and there's several examples that Shannon had provided all over the city where it doesn't go completely on um, the property line, is that he is meeting with this requirement, he is, he is meeting the intent of that preliminary subdivision plan, that he is meeting um, the language in there, the minimum standards. Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is that the practices of the city, you use the word interpretation, but I would use the word administration or the, the, the way it's been administered, the way it's been practiced is how it's meeting the design standards. However, mm -hmm. you know, a judge may interpret that differently, you know, because it says shall, you know, and it says it shall comply with the Cor correct. If, you know, if they would go to the, that, the could, they could interpret plan. that differently. That's that's now how how we're interpreting it. I believe the clients and their representatives are interpreting it the other way. So, okay. thank you. All right. Thank you. Other questions for staff council? For let's get a motion on the floor then, shall we? Move approval. Second, Jensen. All right. Motion by Selberg. Seconded by Jensen. All right, let's move in any discussion on, council, on the council. Councilor Neitzer, go ahead. You know, I, I've continued to go in circles on this, and, that, and, and I keep coming back, and I'm struggling with the language that has been talked about. Uh, 157098 sub D part 3. Collectors shall be developed along or between property lines so that both landowners can share in the cost as well as having access to the collector. And, you know, I, I just keep thinking to myself, um, not being an attorney, but liking to play one on TV frequently. Um, one of the things that you hear all the time they say is, give the language its plain meaning. And, you know, as I read this, I keep thinking the plain meaning to me is that it should be along or between the property lines so that the cost would be shared. And to read it any other way is to do these mental gymnastics, and, and that's what I continue to struggle with is, yeah, I suppose you could read it, read it the other way, but that's not the obvious, the obvious verbiage. It just seems like the plain language is saying that it should go on the property line, and, and, you know, and when you look at the, at the subdivision regulations, it talks about the standards for approval, and one of them is lot and block layout comply with 157.095 through 157.098. And this is in 157098. And so I asked myself, is this complying with it? And I, I'm just really struggling with it. Now, um, I think both sides maybe have arguments. And I, I, I think I should just put to the side whoever is necessarily going to have the best development potential or make the most money. Um, I, I, I shouldn't be really tipping my, putting my finger on the scale on that or even caring about that, except to the extent that the ordinance does also tell us that we are supposed to be looking at um, neighboring property owners that, that we're not creating hardships and we're not harming them. Um, it, so I, I guess, and I've come full circle on this. I've spun around in, for two or three weeks on this. Um, I, I think I have to give the, the ordinance its plain meaning. Um, I, I think you're torturing it to try to come up with a way to read it any other way, particularly considering that there are plenty of options that, and this happens all the time, and I, I talk to developers, it happens all the time. Sometimes they have to suck it up and they, have, they build the whole, the whole road because they're ready to go and the other one isn't ready to go and they don't even have a private agreement. They're never gonna get their money back. Sometimes they come to a cost recovery Sometimes they do half the road. There, there's a lot of ways and you can skin this cat. Um, and I'm confident even if I voted this, even if this was um, not approved tonight, um, under this plan or another plan, 
development can happen it's not going to stop development so i think it's a red herring if you believe that that housing isn't going to get built if this isn't if this isn't, isn't figured out so um, i guess we have a motion on the table so i'm going to probably um, move to amend it uh, with a requirement that the that the collector would be uh, developed along or between the property line all right do we have a second for that Second, star. All right. Please. Motion by Nitzer, seconded by Would star. A uh, to have a motion that the collector is developed along the property line. Can Discussion on that, Councilor Erickson? Yeah, just point of clarification. Does this have to be remanded back to the Planning Commission if that is a substitute? And would this be mm. two questions? One, is this a condition? And two, if this is a condition and passes, does it have to essentially be remanded back to the Planning Commission because of its substantive nature? City Attorney, you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I do have some concerns with that. Paul, I'd ask for your input on that too. Paul is the Assistant City Attorney that's been working on this case. And, uh, Thank you. Sorry, I knew you were going to be here and I should have just addressed it to you. Uh, Paul Bank for the City Attorney's Office. Uh, you can, there are three things you could do. You can approve, you can deny, or you can approve with conditions. Um, However, that condition that would modify the, the road, I think, is one that if, if that is the, the course that, that the council takes, that, that should be remanded back to the Planning Commission. I think that that is probably, uh, I mean, there's some argument that that is uh, placing a condition on it, but I think the safest thing to do at that point would be to send it back to Planning Commission because of uh, how substantial that would be. And then a follow-up, if I can. Go ahead. If, if that's the case that... And I don't know where the votes are, but if a condition is added and that all happens, if the applicant is like, I don't want to do that, can he withdraw it from the planning commissioner? How does, how does that work? Like, I mean, because if that's beyond what they wanted and they're like, well, we don't want to do that, we'd rather go back to the drawing board than do that, then maybe we deny it and we go forward. I, I don't know what that looks like. I'm just curious. Sure. But on a zoning issue, if a zoning issue is denied, uh, there's six months before that can bring, be brought back. On a, a subdivision uh, preliminary plan like this, there is no specific time frame. So both of those options are on the table. You could deny the plan that's there. Um, you could indicate that you want the road to be uh, completely on the, uh, the, the shared property line and, uh, and, and ask that that be remanded back to the to the Planning Commission to review from that standpoint. I think either of those options are available, but um, I, I think that, that if the plan is to have that completely between the property lines, that's probably more than uh, this ordinance uh, uh, it, it would, 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 uh, would handle in terms of a, of a modification. Uh, to me, a modification, uh, this would be substantial. And I think that either, either denying it, that there's no that there's no specific time frame before when they could bring it back to the planning commission or remanding it back to the planning commission with the uh, with the direction that you want okay. to complete one, between the property lines. So we've got one, sorry, I'm just trying to process this to make sure I understand what I'm voting on and how it works. Okay, we've got item number 40, that's before 21. The next one will be the rezone. So item 40 is the preliminary plan. So if we say, hey, for the preliminary plan, you have to do this, we remand it back, we can pass the rezone, Plans change all the time, though. Um, I, I don't want to make assumptions on behalf of the applicant, but if, yeah. if this was denied or abandoned back to the Planning Commission, uh, my thought is that they may move to withdraw um, <coughs> item 21 on the, the rezone at that time, but I don't want to speak for them okay. because that has implications. If that's denied, that's a, that's a six months before it could be brought back. So that's, that's my question, too, is strategically speaking, if that's the direction that this council chooses to go, does it make sense to remand it back so we don't deny it for six months and so mm -hmm. the ball's still up in the air until it's completely figured out? Correct. So the applicant's wishes would be if you guys vote on the amendment that you're doing now and that passes for you to deny the preliminary subdivision plan, don't remand it back, and then we would remand back the rezoning because he's going to have to rework his zoning and the preliminary <laughs> subdivision plan and then we would bring those back together. Okay, so deny 40, approve 
and that no, no I'm sorry. remand. Okay, 21. so deny 40 and remand 21 back yep. to the and planning so commission with the intent of the condition to be down the section. That he's going to submit a brand new preliminary subdivision plan, and we want to run them concurrently again, like we normally do with those. So, so you can Thank vote you. on the amendment, and if that would pass, where that condition would get added then the applicant would request that you would vote down the preliminary subdivision plan instead of remanding it back um, and then go forward and, and remand back the rezoning and we would go forward probably in in January with both of them again it usually takes about six weeks so that makes sense Thank okay you. Councilor Neitzer well, well go ahead attorney if I may counsel just just to speak to the, the amendment component and to sort of add on to what attorney Bankford stated often consider when doing a substantive analysis for this immediate amendment vote is the prejudice the potential prejudice to the two parties right and and uh from the the discussion that was had last time the costs associated with having to rework the plan which i think would be necessary as part of the amendment piece and so i share uh, paul's concerns regarding the substantive component of the amendment councillor nicer um, so, first of all, my amendment, I believe I'm just trying to do what's in the public good and following the law regardless of however it helps or, or doesn't help either party. Um, it, I, I do want to make clear that, uh, just so we're all very clear, when I said, um, I, I did say, as the language said, along or between property lines. So that could be splitting it 40-40, that could be 80 feet all on one, on, 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 on his property, it, whatever. Either way, that gives full access to both parties. Um, that's something that parties can work out. And, and I was speaking specifically of Ron Ziak here. So when I, when I said the collector, I meant Ron Ziak um, and Ron, regarding Broke. So just clarification. Thanks. Other discussion on the amendment here? All right, I'm hearing none, so let's take a vote on uh, the amendment that's on the floor. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? No. Jensen? No. Kylie? Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? No. Sale? Yes. All right, so the amendment passes four to three. So now we're back to the main motion as amended. Any discussion on that? This is so to be clear, the applicant, I guess I'd like to know if the applicant would like it voted down under these circumstances. That's why I voted so they can, no. So if you could explain to me what you just voted on so <laughs> that I can explain to you okay. what, what we feel should take place. Would you, would you like me to miss Mr. Mayor? Or? Go ahead, Councilor Neitzer. Yeah, so uh, the, the vote was that the plan is approved uh, except uh, that Ronziak would have to be built on or between the property line. So it would have to be These on that. plans line. won't be, this won't, this won't be the plan. That's right. So you can basically, in fairness, I guess, in my view, this is an industry standard plan meeting the city staff's design guidelines to place conditions on it and then approve it is basic does not work because this won't be it we'll basically you can sort of toss this one out if the conditions on there so we either need to know if we are if the conditions on there then there's no need for the plan then i would say if, if that's if you want the condition vote to deny it if, in my view, if you want to go with industry standards and allow us to develop just like every other developer, then approve the plan without the condition. But if the condition is automatically on there, then you might as well deny it because we won't be going forward with this plan and we won't be going forward with the reason either. Okay, thank you. Cool. So, do we, do we, Mr. Mayor, could I go ask? Go ahead. Uh, then I'll go to Councilor Erickson. Uh, Jason, do we save him any money if we were to remand this item? versus if he has to completely rework and bring another one forward, do we save him by doing that? Save him another filing fee, even though he's asking us? Because I, I get it, he, you know, this plan won't work if the road has to move, but. He would have to refile again, which would be, I believe, 350, somewhere in there. We don't save him anything by remanding versus voting it down, though. 350. I guess I don't know. That seems pretty negligible to me. I'm, I'm not sure what he said with okay. the filing fee. I mean, it's probably going to cost him a lot more with the engineering aspect of reworking it than a filing fee. But Okay, fair enough. Okay. Councilor Erickson, go ahead. The only thing I was going to just reiterate is, is based on the feedback that we got, is deny item 40, 
21 remand it with the condition of it going down the section line if that's people what people want so we would we would need a motion to approve on 40 deny it 21 would be a motion to approve with the condition if that's what people want and or rework that with it would go back to planning commission so those are the two steps just as i process this based on your feedback and and you vote your conscience of what you choose to do, whether you support that or not. Got it. Got it. All right. Other discussion then on the main motion as amended. All right. Let's vote on this then. Council Member Starr. No. Brecky. No. Erickson. No. Jensen. No. Kylie. Neitzert. No. Selberg. No. Sale. No. Oh. All right, that's going to fail seven to zero. And we'll move on to item 21. <clears throat> item 21, second reading, deferred for the meeting of Tuesday, November 9, 2021, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota rezoning property located south of West 41st Street and west of South Ellis Road from the AG Agriculture District, the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District, RD2 Townhome Residential Suburban District, and RA2 Apartment Residential Moderate Density District, number 15101-2021, and amending the official zoning map of the city of Sioux Falls. The Planning Commission recommends approval six to zero. Private applicant, Empire Homes, Brady Hyde. Uh, this is the rezoning that went along with the preliminary plan, and as indicated earlier, we would like, or the applicant would like this to get remanded back to the Planning Commission. All right, thank you. Anyone from the public here to speak on this one then? All right, Council, uh, we want to get a motion on the floor to that effect. I would move to remand this item back to the Planning Commission. Second, Star. All right, motion by Nitzert, seconded by Starr to that effect. Any discussion on that? All right, let's take a vote on that then, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Nitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Okay, that passes eight to zero. Move to item 22. <laughs> Item 22, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by adopting the 2021 International Building Code and, and amendments thereto. Sponsors, the Mayor. Butch, good evening, sir. Good evening, Council Mayor. Uh, Butch Warrington, Chief Building Official. This is to update our code to the IBC, the International Building Code, to the 2021. Uh, comes around every three years for the new codes. Uh, I have met with and worked with Fire Marshal Lanier on a few items that are, coincides with the fire code. I've worked with Denise Hanslick on multi-housing and also had approval from the Building Board of Appeals on this one. All right. Thanks, Butch. Any further public here to speak on item 22? Council, you got any questions for Butch here tonight? Move approval. Second, Jensen. All right. Motion by Selberg, seconded by Jensen to approve this. Any discussion here? Let's vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. That passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 23, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by adopting the 2021 International Existing Building Code and amendments thereto. Sponsors the Mayor. This is the international building or existing building code. This is the code that we use for a lot of downtown projects because it does give us some leeway uh, where you don't have to specifically go to the direct code. Uh, it is sprinkler heavy, I will admit that, but it does help us out a lot on downtown projects. Okay, thanks, Butch. Anyone from the public here to speak on 23? Council, any questions here tonight? Move approval. Second, Jensen. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Jensen. Discussion there, Council? All right, let's vote on that one, please. Council Member Starr? Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes 7 to 0. Next item, please. Item 24, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by adopting the 2021 International Mechanical Code and the 2021 International Fuel Gas Code and amendments thereto, sponsors the Mayor. This is the Mechanical Code and the Fuel Gas Code, so any furnaces, air conditioners, ductwork, and what it relates to, and this is the update, there's not a whole lot doing, but this one we did take to the Mechanical Board of Appeals appeals for their approval. 
All right, thanks, Butch. Anyone from the public here to speak on item 24 here? Any questions tonight, Council? Look for a motion. Move to approve. Second, Erickson. Motion by Kylie, seconded by Erickson. Any discussion on that motion? All right, let's take a vote, please, Tom. Council Member Starr? Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Starr? Yes. All right, that one passes eight to zero. Next item. Item 25, second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the code of ordinances of the city by adopting the 2021 International Residential Code and amendments thereto, sponsors the mayor. This is the International Residential Code. I did meet with the Building Board of Appeals on this one. I did meet with the Home Builders Association. In fact, Todd Nowski is in our audience tonight. Um, not a lot of changes here. Most of the changes were good to help with development. Um, just a key note, we have had over 800 new single family dwellings built in this city or issued in this city this year so far. So uh, we wanna keep them going. All right, thank you, Butch. Anyone uh, here to speak on item 25 tonight? Council, any questions for Butch here? Move approval. Second, Jensen. Motion by Selberg, second by Jensen to approve this one. Any discussion on that? All right, let's vote on that, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that one passes eight to zero. Next item. Item 26, second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the code of ordinances of the city by adopting the international swimming pool and spa code. Sponsors the mayor. This is a new code to us this year. Uh, before we had a lot of amendments in the residential and building code. Well, it's all wrapped up in one little code now, which is gonna make things a lot better for us. Good, thanks Butch. Anyone from the public here to speak on 26? All right, can I get a motion on this one? Move to approve Erickson. Second, Kylie. Motion by Erickson, seconded by Kylie. Any discussion there, council? All right, hearing none, let's take a vote, please. Council member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. That passes eight to zero. Next item. Item 27, second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the code of ordinances of the city by adopting the 2021 International Fire Code and amendments thereto, sponsors the mayor. Good evening, Dean. Mayor, Council, Dean Lanier, Fire Marshal at Sioux Falls Fire Rescue. Uh, here, uh, finishing up with the 2021 International Fire Code, uh, what we presented last week were highlights from additions to the code. So it principally covered anything that was new that was being added to uh, the code as a whole. Uh, there are modifications and, and uh, clarifications within the code, but we didn't go through that because they don't make substantial changes. All right. Thanks, Dean. Anyone from the public here to speak on item 27? All right, Council, you have any questions for Dean tonight? All right, look for a motion. Move approval. Second, Kylie. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Kylie to approve item 27. Any discussion there? All right, let's take a vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. That passes eight to zero. Item 28, please. Item 28, second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, authorizing the issuance of its wastewater system revenue bond in one or more series to the South Dakota Conservancy District, authorizing the use of the proceeds thereof for capital improvements, pledging the wastewater system revenue of the city to the payment of said wastewater system revenue bond, fixing the terms of such wastewater system revenue bond, authorizing the execution and delivery of a loan agreement between the city and the, the South Dakota Conservancy District, and authorizing the execution and delivery of such wastewater system revenue bond to the South, to the South Dakota Conservancy District not to exceed $123 million, sponsors the mayor. Mark, good evening. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. I'm Mark Cotter with the Office of Public Works. Uh, this is a key action, second reading, uh, to fund the expansion of the wastewater plant by 50%. Um, one ask that I would ask of you tonight that we've worked through with Tom Greco is um, at the request of the DANR, um, if one of you would be willing to make an amendment, um, we'd greatly appreciate that. This amendment, got it. 
Yes, sorry, it's uh, it's up on the slide, and it's just to clarify the exhibits that um, accompany the loan agreement. Got it. All right. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Uh, any more to your presentation? That's it. No, that's it. All Thank right. You. Easy. All right. Anyone else here to uh, speak? Anyone here to speak on item 28? All right, Council, any questions on this, or does someone want to introduce that amendment? Sure. Uh, first, I'll, I'll move, uh, move approval. Okay. Second. All right, motion by Neitzert, seconded by Councillor Sale. Uh, Councillor Neitzert. Uh, yes, I would like to make a motion to amend by inserting water reclamation improvements project as outlined in the facilities plan dated June 2019 under Exhibit A and labeling the loan agreement as Exhibit B. Second. All right. Sale. Motion by Neitzert, seconded by Sale on that amendment. Uh, any discussion there? All right, let's vote on that, please. Council Member Starr. Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. We're back to the main motion as amended. Council, you have any questions for Mark tonight or any discussion on this item? Move approval. We got an approval already on the floor, oh, so sorry. we're good to go there. Mr. Uh, Mayor. Councilor Starr, go ahead. Yes, how could you not talk about a $130 million expenditure and move it through? This is one of the biggest things we'll do while we're here. We're investing in our city's infrastructure, looking at the, the growth of our city and updating equipment. Director Cotter, you've done an incredible job shepherding this program. It's been a lot of work and uh, your department has done an ex an exemplary job of bringing this forward and looking into the future for our city to provide uh, wastewater uh, needs and water reclamation and to not praise your department for moving this forward, would I'd miss an opportunity. So thank you and thank you for all the people on your team uh, as well as our vendors and associates that we brought in as part of this project. We spent a lot of time also as a council talking about it, but um, this is very forward thinking and an investment in our city to, to provide a, a, a safe environment for those downstream from us as well. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Any other discussion on this item? All right. Let's vote on the motion as amended then. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Sale? Yes. That passes 8 to 0. Item 29. Item 29, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, providing supplemental appropriations, highways and streets, $3.3 million, sponsors the mayor. Um, more good news, more infrastructure. So at the beginning of the year, we set a budget uh, for arterial street platting fees of $2.54 million. Um, we've collected to date with the robust growth and extensive platting throughout the city of about 5.537 million. Um, we would ask for your support with the um, additional uh, appropriation of the 3.3 million that we can uh, apply to more arterial street uh, investments that we covered last week. All right. Thank you, Mark. Anyone from the public here to speak on this item? Council, you have any questions for Mark tonight? Look for a motion, please. Move approval, Jensen. Second, Neitzer. All right, motion by Jensen, seconded by Neitzer to approve 29. Any discussion on that? Let's vote on it, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. That passes 8 to 0. On to uh, item 46, which was moved by amendment. Item 46, a resolution amending the 2021-2025 capital program, Highways and Streets, $3.3 million, sponsors the mayor. Uh, this is a companion item to the last item. This essentially amends the capital plan um, to recognize the new revenue amount. All right, thanks, Mark. Anyone from the public here to speak on that? All right, councilors, can I get a motion on this item? Move to approve Second, Brecky. All right, motion by Erickson, seconded by Brecky. Any discussion there? All right, let's vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Passes 8 to 0. On to item 30, please. Item 30, second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending Chapter 57, Garbage and Recycling of the Code of Ordinances of the City pertaining to the collection, to, to the collection regulations. Sponsors the Mayor. 
Mark. Uh, Mayor and Council, this builds on last week's discussion. We had a really thoughtful and healthy discussion about uh, next steps for solid waste collection. Um, the uh, ordinance language that's in front of you uh, really reorganizes and consolidates residential garbage, recycling, and yard waste into three areas. Uh, services required, containers, and container placement. Uh, we got extensive input. Um, 4,000 citizens uh, responded to this survey. Uh, the commercial haulers, many of which are, reckon are here tonight, um, Solid Waste Planning Board, and a thoughtful discussion uh, with you at this council. Um, we uh, understand that there is uh, potentially two amendments <coughs> to the proposed uh, ordinance that we've put forward, and so we are also here to uh, respond to those accordingly. So with that, I'll yield to your questions. All right, thanks, Mark. Anyone from the public here to speak on this item tonight? Come on up. Good evening, sir. We got it up. City magic. Uh, Mayor, Council, I'm uh, Mike Herbst from Villanova Avenue, South Villanova Avenue. I also represent Novak Sanitary Service. A um, lot of discussion last week and a lot of concerns. I don't envy anybody sitting up here that has to make decisions that are positive or negative for the city or how they're perceived by residents. Uh, I drafted this letter that I published here. You know, everything that we're doing here is very transparent. Nothing is hidden. I sent this to all of you through the city website. I'm hoping you had an opportunity to review it. Uh, if you haven't, it's here now. I just wanted to touch on a couple things. I know there's a lot of representation here tonight, and I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, number five and number seven are what I want to focus on. There was a lot of comments about the current system is not broken. Well, it is. Uh, if the city staff, the Solid Waste Planning Board, and all of the hauling community have come together over months to analyze what's going on with our current service system, make recommendations, mull it over, spend hours upon hours engaging with you all and the community, uh, that's obvious that there's a problem. Those are the professionals in the industry. People sitting up here are not the professionals in the industry, so saying that the system is not broken is not relevant. Uh, it is broken and we're trying to get ahead of it. It may not be broken yet to where we're like New York and Portland and Philadelphia, where the garbage is piled up on the curbs uh, because of lack of workers, but that moves into the next labor shortage. So we have a labor shortage here and we know it. We discussed this, I know it was discussed last week, uh, over 500 CDL positions open right now just in Sioux Falls. Uh, one of the council members mentioned last week the regulations coming in February federal government regulations, which are going to make it tremendously difficult for us to train our own people, which many of the haulers have done up until this point. Uh, another thing I wanted to note about that was if we don't think that there's a labor problem in a CDL issue, uh, also sent forward through Mark Cotter in the city today, my children's bus has been late 14 times since school started because of lack of drivers. It didn't run this morning. Um, if it's affecting our children at schools, it's also affecting a utility, which is what the garbage service is. And it's going to get to a point where we have to make choices. We want to stay sustainable, but when we can't get the garbage off the street because of labor, because we're walking up and down every driveway, well, the next thing we're going to do is dump recycling as garbage because we can't let the garbage pack pile up or we leave recycling on the street. We don't want to do that. It's a sustainable city. We, we spent a lot of energy trying to keep our city clean, and we are, have come together as a community and said, hey, this is the best move forward to help the city keep it clean and move into the next step as we move forward. Any questions? Thank you. Potentially, Absolutely. we'll call you up if, if, if the council has questions. Come on up, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor and council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Julie Ketchum. I'm with Waste Management, Public Affairs. I have the states of Minnesota, Iowa, North and South Dakota. Um, related to the labor market, I just wanted to emphasize a few things there. Um, you know, everyone is looking for employees. They want to get fully staffed up. It doesn't matter what business you're in. But the uh, trucking industry has suffered greater uh, than any other business, and especially the trash industry, in part because we are now competing with Amazon and on, on 
online retail for drivers. So there's a, a dearth of uh, CDL drivers out there. There aren't many in the pipeline, not a lot, lot of young uh, new drivers that are um, getting in line for these positions. And so we are looking uh, for people. Um, we have drivers that have walked off the job on day one. We've had drivers that have walked off the job because of the heat wave, three or four in one day. And so we are trying to provide <coughs> a public health service with a few employees that um, are doing a really difficult, challenging job. So valet service requires more time. That means more drivers. So if we're taking the time to walk up and back and walk up again and back four times up a driveway, yeah, that's a, a lot of extra time spent doing that. Um, and that means we have to hire more people. Um, and, and again, we think about our people. We put them first. And the liability concerns that we have will shift to the homeowner um, when our drivers slip, trip, or fall on, on driveways. These are uncharted territories for our drivers. It's not familiar to them. They're on new property. They're navigating that property. And sometimes it's maintained and sometimes it's not. And so we are concerned with um, that shift in potential risk to the homeowners of paying for those injuries. Um, there were questions at the last uh, meeting about um, whether anyone in the industry would provide valet service. I can assure you that yes, we will. We care just as much about the elderly and, and the infirm, the uh, people that are um, uh, disabled, and we will accommodate those concerns. We're doing it now. Uh, to those that are truly disabled. We work with them and figure out a way to provide them service. Uh, lastly, um, the uh, curbside collection is just better for the environment. Uh, so you're talking about three times as many uh, emissions that are generated when you're doing valet versus curbside. That's a lot. That's your air quality and it's in your neighborhoods. So, and then, and then with trucks, we can reduce our fleet by 50% if we move from valet, if we were to re, were required to do valet, and instead of curbside, we could, um, we, it would mean more trucks out on the street. So with curbside, we can um, cut our fleet in half. And that's a lot, that's a better quality of life for the residents and the people in the neighborhood. So in conclusion, I urge you to, um, to approve the, the staff recommendation, the amendment that they offered last week that's on its second reading. And we just want to be allowed to offer both types of service, valet and curbside, and let that be a choice between the hauler and the resident. Thank you. All right, thanks, Julie. What else here to speak on this item? Come on up. Issue. You know how development switches? They say one thing and then another happens. So if they get this voted and it goes their way, they're going to have it everybody um, a ballet. We need to, and I wish Colleen Moran from the state attorney's office would have came today, but she couldn't. We have an issue with ADA. I don't give a damn about the trash pickup. You leave it at the house. And you charge everybody. Do you think that this guy in this wheelchair that might not have help can get this to the road in icy weather and bring it back to his, his place? This is politics. They want it, they want council to pass it, and then they're going to say, oh, yeah, we're going to do that. And then before you know it, bam, we're going to do the opposite and to screw the citizens, just like development does. We're going to do, we're going to build something and then all of a sudden we're going to change it and it's already set in stone. So we're going to screw the neighborhood and you're just going to have to live with that. Right? Yeah. We know about development, don't we? It happened many of times. How many times in development has happened where people had to fight for it? This is just like development. They're going to say one thing, y'all going to prove it or just if y'all prove it and they're going to say, oh, we're going to do it. And then all of a sudden, it's not going to go that way. It's going to head south. 
They have no conscience, my stomach, I want to vomit on these people. The disability people and the people that cannot get that trash out, how can they sit here and come out here and don't even have a heart that's bleeding warm blood to see that guy sitting right here that is disabled and many other people that might can't get their garbage out to the road. And we're Christian people? We're Christians. So they advertise on some of their trucks. We're Christians. Christians on your sleeve. You can back up from the mic a little okay? bit. Okay. Christians on your sleeve. They're not real Christians. Real Christians don't do this. I asked that it be a, it's probably going to be a force for a vote, and then the mayor's going to bring the tie. I've already emailed the mayor. We've got to put politics aside. This is disgusting. Disgusting. I don't care, the rich, the poor, all, all of you. How would you like it? Southeast District, who else has rich people? Do y'all have people that's like this guy in this wheelchair that can't put it to the road? He might not have LifeScape. He might not have help at his house. And who is to say if he does? How dare they go to church? You Christians, they better go to church. They need all the blessings they can get. Christian people doing this. We're all for the people of our community. All right, thank you. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Members. You state your name, please. My name is Nancy Larson. On behalf of Meadowbrook and Songbird Editions, um, our, in the past, our neighborhood has seen some negative changes in the past year that have not only affected our neighborhood, but have affected our community as a whole. Today, our neighborhood is littered with garbage canisters. Over 90% of the residents in our neighborhood have canisters stored in their home, in front of their homes. A landfill representative traveled through our neighborhood and a placed door knockers on each one of the garbage containers. Nothing changed. We often see canisters blown over in our yards. They're across the sidewalks. They're down the driveways. Um, lids are being blown open. Garbage is falling out, and we've had a lot of increased litter in our neighborhood. In addition, neighbors have different haulers, and that produces canisters at the end of the driveways for a few days every week, giving our neighborhood a trashy appearance. If the hauler doesn't return the canister to the structure, we have observed canisters blocking the driveways. Some neighbors have left the canister curbside for days. We'll watch them bring out garbage to their curb for a week and not return that canister back up to their home. This is a perfect example. This neighbor has garbage pickup on Friday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. The cans are still sitting curbside. It's very frustrating when a family will take a vacation on a weekend and leave their canisters curbside for the neighbors to look at. We've also witnessed neighbors who have, don't understand or how to dispose of garbage. We've watched neighbors dump cat boxes straight into their canisters. We have a home daycare in the neighborhood where diapers and diaper wipes are just placed in the canisters. So when that wind blows and the canister lid opens, those diaper wipes have actually been in our neighborhood. Residents have bagged their grass, dumped it in the containers. And I, going back to Josh Petersons, the city environmental service manager noted at, I believe, the last meeting that he spent a considerable amount of time engaging with haulers. Disappointingly, he didn't spend time communicating with residents. For an online-only survey, 
that was only on, I believe, for what, maybe a week? And out of 180,000 residents approximately we have in this community, 4,000 replied. That's 2%. I sympathize with haulers. However, their complaints of wages and employee retention is a struggle for most businesses. My son works in construction. He's having a hard time as a foreman keeping employees, but there's no one there to help him. I believe they have also mentioned that curbside would save them money to purchase better trucks. Well, we might save on lower emissions, but we will pay with the increased litter in the city and our environment. Adding curbside collection to the ordinance without a mandate will not protect the residents nor our community and will only cause further harm. Sanitation companies will force curbside upon customers by increasing their rates for valet service and the litter will continue to accumulate in our neighborhoods because re res residents will choose the lesser of the garbage rates and take the curbside. All through town there's garbage in parking lots, around fence lines, and this, I've traveled through Sioux Falls. New neighborhoods, old neighborhoods, they, they all have the same issues. It's all over the place. Our neighborhood runs along a creek and a family park. Some of our neighbors share the same lack of knowledge or simply just don't care because the city doesn't enforce its ordinances. According to the online survey, most residents said they were unaware of current current ordinances, which states that garbage and recycling containers Thank shall you, be Nancy. kept in an inconspicuous spot beside or behind the home. Thank you, Nancy. Appreciate your input. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Come on up. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Council. Um, Patrick Drazy with Novak. Um, I'm here as a citizen, though. I've lived in Sioux Falls my whole life. I. Uh, pretty much born and raised here. And uh, the town I used to love is now a city. It's growing, it's growing. And the labor pains that we have in the industry, we cannot sustain moving forward. The, the way that we used to be able to pick up trash at the curb, not on the curb, was, was doable. Now the town has doubled in size since I've been alive. Technology has made it so that we can improve our industry and improve our efficiencies. If we don't make any changes, we're gonna have a much more trash problem because of the labor market. FMCSA laws in February is gonna make it next to impossible to hire new CDL holders. Um, as a citizen, we just need to make sure we're growing our ordinances as our town, which is now a city, is growing as well. Thanks. All right, thanks Patrick. Anyone else here to speak on this one tonight? Come on up. Good evening. Mike, Mike Zierz again. I think I don't think I have too big of a problem with with this ordinance change. I mean, I think I don't think it's asking too much of of our neighbors to bring the cans down to the curb and, and back back at the end of the day. I think that's part of the responsibility. I think you gotta, if you own a house, own an apartment, I think part of the responsibility as a property owner is to keep keep your own yard picked up. I think if you want your neighborhood to look nice, I think that's the res responsibility of your neighborhood. And your fellow neighbors so I, I don't think we're asking too much for it i think if the if the citizens are more concerned with the cost of their garbage maybe we maybe we'll look at the wrong maybe we'll look at the problem from the wrong angle maybe it's the regulations but we can trim back cut back perhaps to save the save the citizens money maybe it's to just cut back on the regulations a little bit and help save save the money save costs on the on the industry itself that's just my two cents. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Mike. Anyone else here to speak on this one tonight? Come on up, guys. I think there's a handheld mic on the table we can get for you. Good evening. I'm 
Travis Arneson, 814 West 20th. First off, I would like to applaud all the men and women in this industry. It has to be a hard job. I don't like picking up my own child's diapers. <laughs> More or less someone else's. So thank you. You <laughs> You heard another citizen use me as an argument. I'm truly not here for myself. I'm awful blessed. I have horsepower behind my wheels. I've I've pushed cars off the street before. I can move a garbage can. My concern. Is those people who are less fortunate than I am? And I know so many of them. And are afraid to speak up. When they can't do a simple task, go get their mail, take out their own trash. As a human, that lowers something inside. Mentally, it's very unhealthy. You heard a lot of companies state tonight that they will have a clause for that issue. I can state all I want, but where is it in writing? If it's not in writing, it's just hot air. We used to live on a hand cycle. We used to do handshakes alone. In today's world, unfortunately, that's an issue. Not the issue. If it's not in writing, it's not so. My last item, I am concerned about litter. We do live in South Dakota. The wind is all over the place. 
One minute it comes, the next minute it's 100 miles per hour. Thank you, Travis. Appreciate you being here tonight. And you as well, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else to speak on uh, item 30 tonight? Come on up. Good evening, ma'am. Hi, I'm Ruby with Ruth Sanitation, and I just wanted to address you quickly. Um, we have a smaller company. We have five to six drivers, and we would just like to have the option. Uh, we would continue to offer both services. Um, just it's it's hard. Um, I know we've had eight drivers that we've hired this year that have not made it out of training. So within two weeks, they've started and quit. And so with a team of five to six drivers, having eight people not make it out of training, that's a lot of um, trying to find drivers is definitely a shortage. Um, but we do, with the ordinance that we had in 2020 where we allowed curbside service, we still took all of our containers back to their houses. Um, we just like to have that option and that availability for our company. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak then on item 30? Come on up. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Tim Duppy, Novak Sanitary Services, Shermayor Council. Uh, I know I was passionate the last time I was up here because I believe and want this community to thrive and move forward. We understand there's issues, but there's issues all the way across the board, and we're focusing on one thing, okay? We're asking as a hauler and a profession to allow us to do what's right, okay? Give us the opportunity and give the residents of this town the option. You have control over dictating what we kind of do. You can mandate that we do valet. You can say, hey, you can do curbside. Or you can sit there and go, look, we just had to fill out our, follow, our uh, hauler license this month. And you ask us for what our prices are and our variances. But what you don't ask is the important question. <clears throat> What are we going to offer our seniors? What are we going to offer our ADA members that are in the community? What are we going to offer our customers that want the valet services? Okay, there's a lot of things you guys haven't looked at. And I'm almost sad to say, as I want to say is, hey, why don't you talk to us? We sent you a letter. Okay, you use the largest planning board that you have. Solid Waste Commission, with all their people that are sitting on it. Are you listening to them? We're a part of that. We're at the hour meeting. Councilman Benke, thank you for being at the last meeting. Where were the rest of you? If this is so important to you, why aren't you involved? Okay? We're all residents here. Okay? And I understand that you may have constituents that are telling you certain items that they're, it's important to you. And yes, I understand the lady that came up here that's in a subdivision. And hey, we had 4,000 people respond to that survey. But there's not ways that we can really come out and give this to everybody. Unless, hey, let everybody know. Do you, do you have a way to everybody's email comes out? No, but come on, let's sit down and talk about this. This is open communication, not first reading. This is the second reading. If there's an amendment, there's going to be a third read, you know, another reading for what we're going to change. So why not talk to the professionals? We're here. I came up here last week and said, any one of you to want to discuss this, we're here. Some of you are our customers. Some of you are customers of our other, our haulers, okay? We have it all in the best interest of our city. We are all residents here in the city, and not only the city, but the five counties that feed the landfill. You have, within the next month and a half, 1,200 homes that are about ready to open up and people are going to move into. If you take that up, that's 96 
9,600 homes next year? And if we're telling you there's a problem that we're not going to be able to pick the trash up, again, I was passionate last week. I'm passionate this time. How are we going to do it? How do you see fit that we're going to be able to do it? We're saying, give us the opportunity to do it two different ways or three different ways. Let's talk about it instead of this dialogue, okay? Because you're going to try to make a decision tonight. Let's talk. Keep it open. Again, listen to your largest board that's brought forward after painstaking dialogue with the haulers and the community of what they need to do. Okay? Just be open-minded. That's all we ask. We're the professionals. The one thing I want to say is we just had a talk earlier today about all the building changes that want to go through. And you kind of just went right through them, right? Did you read how detailed they were? Okay, that's all we're asking. Thank you. Anyone else here to speak tonight on this item? All right, seeing no more public input here, let's move on to uh, some discussion. I think um, first thing we'll do, is there any questions for the staff or should we move into our discussion? I don't, I don't see any questions. So uh, let's get a motion on the floor. Move approval, Jensen. All right, motion by Jensen, we have a second? Second. All right, motion by Jensen and seconded by uh, Councillor Kiley. All right, Councillor Kiley, did you uh, want the floor? Well, I, I do have an amendment. I do know also that Councillor Neitzert has an amendment that's been on the docket longer than mine, so I am going to defer to Councillor Neitzert out of fairness to let him address his. However, before we do vote on his amendment, I will express what mine is so that we are aware of what all the options are. Go ahead. Uh, so do you want to introduce yours or just kind of tee it up uh, well, real quick? Well, I, I believe, I'm, I don't think that we can have two amendments on the floor at the same time. Won't so, be an amendment. Maybe you just kind of allude to what I will, you're going to be proposing. I will very briefly address it after Councillor uh, Neitzer goes into his. Councillor Neitzer, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kiley. Uh, so my, I talked about my amendment last week, and uh, my subhead here is preserving the current standard, and, and that's because I, I think we have a community standard, and it, it is worth preserving. Uh, essentially, it would maintain the status quo, but it would make the language a little more clear and make it very, very clear who has to do what uh, and where the, where the can has to be. It has to be reasonably accessible. Uh, in an inconspicuous space, a place which is kind of a, a term of art, essentially close to the home or the building. Um, and the commercial garbage hauler would have to retrieve it, bring it down, and bring it back up. And that would be what we have today. Uh, I think the benefit of, you can go to the next slide. It, not only does it provide clarity as to who is responsible for what, because we've had this standard, but the language has been a, a little tough to understand and there's been a little bit of debate about it. But it really preserves a current and long-standing community standard. This isn't anything new. We're not asking haulers to do anything different than they've done for several years. And um, it, it, as far as the, the um, input on the issue, the survey does provide one data point, but it's not a scientific survey. I, I would caution on giving it too much weight. I would give it as much weight as all the direct input that we're getting. Um, you know, that was a self-selected survey. You went out and you took it. Um, and so um, it's, you really can't extrapolate that to, to know whether or not that represents the entire population. Just like people who reach out to us directly, they're self-selecting. So um, I, I will tell you for what it's worth, I saw the survey, but it, the input that I have received has been overwhelmingly well over 90% wanting to preserve, this, preserve the, the current standard. I get, um, you know, aesthetics, that's really a big deal. We have, we have strict uh, zoning rules here in the city. We take a lot of pride in having clean and well-maintained neighborhoods. That's a big deal to us. The location of garbage cans is a big factor in that. And particularly when we have multiple haulers collecting on multiple days of the week in every neighborhood. I, I've said this before, if we had a model where we had a municipal hauler or one pickup day a week, it might be different, but you literally have cans out uh, it, almost every single day of the week, depending on, on what, what uh, haulers are working uh, and who, what people subscribe to. Uh, 
So we're big on zoning codes and code enforcement, and I would submit that this is a community standard, um, and this is important. I get the haulers' desire to change. They've wanted to go curbside for a long time. This isn't new. I, I certainly understand the pressures. Uh, uh, COVID is the newest issue and, and some of the things that are going on in our economy, but this isn't a new argument. Um, I'm pro-business and I'm pro-hauler, but I also think it's uh, well within our power and it is appropriate, and we do this all the time with, with industries that we regulate or utilities in which we outsource or, or we, let, we give people franchises, for example, that we set certain minimum standards and they have to follow it. The free market argument uh, sounds attractive on its face. The compelling reason is that the, the customer could decide and it's a, it would be a free market. But let's be honest, the garbage industry is not a free market. Uh, there's a whole number of, of things that the garbage haulers have to follow. Uh, they have to apply for a license. We regulate what their, what their trucks, the sort of inspections and all these other things. There's a lot of standards that we, that we make them, them follow. Uh, this is not uh, a pure free market already, so let's not fool ourselves in that. Uh, to provide this critical services, uh, we impose rules and regulations for, for those providers, and that's not anything unique. This city council and previous city councils have supported a multiple hauler, hauler model, not one municipal hauler, not one hauler per neighborhood per district, district and I strongly support that. I, I think that's um, been to our benefit. We have a lot of uh, choices out there, um, and you can choose the hauler that you would, you want. And we've rejected the idea of capping haulers, and we haven't said let's have one collection day for all haulers in any given neighborhood. Those are all things that people bring up quite a bit, and sometimes people that move from other cities ask about that. And I've lived in other cities where those have been there. But the point is, is that the consequence of all of these decisions we've made is we have a model, again, with multiple haulers in every neighborhood every day of the week. The consequences of our model is that because we have that, curbside placement would mean cans would be at the street every day of the week around a neighborhood. For city staff or a citizen to know if a can is in violation, like I said last week, you would have to know what day of the week is a collection day for that particular hauler at that particular address. It's going to be almost impossible to know that. A can is going to sit there for days and you're not going to know what, when, the, when the collection day is. So enforcing it is going to be a, a, a nightmare. Uh, again, if we had a single collection day and a single hauler model, uh, it, it may be different and it may be less impactful if you had cans out one day a week and everybody knew when they were going to be out. So the likely consequences on pricing if we allow curbside. Um, first of all, everybody is paying for the current standard. Now, of course, our prices can go up every year. Uh, we may see fuel surcharges. We may see things like that with things going on in the economy. I get that. Um, and they're free to raise their rates, but we also have a lot of different haulers that will help to keep each other in check. And if they raise their rates too much, I can always switch to another hauler. Um, I would submit we already know what's going to happen. The, and we know from the largest hauler in the United States and what they did here. Uh, when I talked to people who were, that called me, I called, had a disabled uh, veteran who called me. I had elderly people that called me. And you know what they did? They slapped them with $12 service charges to follow the ordinance. That's what they did, and that's what's going to happen. Sure, they'll give you, a lot of them will say, well, we'll give you this, but you're going to pay an extra $12 for it. So their prices are going to go up. Some of them, maybe it'll stay the same. So a lot of people are probably going to get the same service, but it's going to cost more, or they're going to have inferior service for the same price. Uh, I, I doubt with the pressures you have right now, anybody's going to uh, drop their prices. I, I, I think that would be well, wishful thinking. Uh, so it, it's been argued that enforcement and knowledge of the current standard is a problem. Yeah, it is a problem. There has been confusion with what went on with COVID, but I think uh, some have taken advantage of that. I haven't once, I'm not aware of, I mean, maybe it's happened, but I'm not aware of any haulers that have told homeowners that you're supposed to, uh, where you're supposed to put your cans. And I understand why. I mean, you know, if you bring it down, then that helps them out. Um, has the city done uh, 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 a good job at educating and getting people to know what the law is? I don't think so. Um, I think they've made a little bit of an effort, but um, I, I, I think in some cases, you know, ig ignorance of, of uh, you know, if, if a law doesn't make sense and people don't know about it, you get rid of it. But here in this case, I think it has value. So I don't think you get rid of it. 
I think you figure out how to educate and you, and you enforce. So I, I go back to, and, and this was mentioned, and I guess I respectfully disagree, that um, nothing is broken. Uh, why fix it? We've had this standard for many years, and that's why we've had a, had a clean community. Uh, it, it's the community standard that, that we believe in, and it's really uh, a consequence of, of the model that we have. And I think that we're really um, going to make a mistake uh, if we just give this up, because I don't think you get it back. Um, as far as other potential options, uh, I, I think even um, if you have the option or you require the hauler to uh, provide the option, you still are going to have potentially uh, prices going up, uh, things like that. Um, so I, I guess in closing, uh, I would say this is a, a big community standard, and I've heard from so many people who have reached out who have said that this is really important to them, and they're willing to pay for it, and they're already paying for it. Um, so I would just urge that we don't fix something that isn't broken. Thank you. All right. So is that an official motion? It's a long motion. If you'd you like me to put that motion on the floor now, I can. Um, I will make a motion to amend section 57023 by substituting the contents of paragraph B, collection day placement location with, quote, all containers shall be placed adjacent to the structure by the owner, occupant, or manager in an inconspicuous place that is reasonably accessible to the licensed commercial garbage hauler, period. It is a commercial garbage hauler's responsibility to retrieve the containers from and return the containers to this inconspicuous and readily accessible place on collection day, end quote. And by striking paragraphs C and D. Second, Brecky. All right, motion by Neitzert, seconded by Brecky. Uh, Councilor Kylie, you wanna, before we have discussion on that, just give a flavor of what you're gonna be interested in? Yes, I do, so that. My, my colleagues on the council have an understanding that there is going to be another option for an amendment. Uh, just an explanation. We can only entertain one amendment uh, at a time. So, but I do want to make sure that everybody is clear what their options are here this, uh, this evening. Um, I heard Travis loud and clear. Heard Travis last week. Um, I want you to know that I've got your back and the back of a lot of other uh, members in this community too. So, uh, Travis, it will be in writing with my amendment. Uh, it'll state all commercial garbage haulers as a condition of licensure must offer a minimum of two levels of service. Curbside service would be one, must offer valet service, meaning the haulers will go up, collect the container, dump, dump the contents, return the container, uh, and then they go on to their next. They must. It, it's not just based on what they say they're going to do. So that's, that's one of the things that I asked for last week is, is that assurance. Um, this provides that assurance. I, I, think, it's, I think this is a, a common sense amendment, one that gives our, our, our customers, the consumers, a choice of what level of service that they want. I enjoy, I enjoy choices. This will give everybody that choice. Uh, it, again, it requires valet, so it protects those individuals that need the service or just simply uh, wants the service. And again, it puts it in writing that that service has to be offered, has to be offered uh, by their uh, by their hauler. It also at the same time adds a great deal of efficiency uh, to the whole process of of collecting our refuge throughout throughout the city. That efficiency, I'm hopeful, is going to be uh, passed on to the consumer as well. Okay, hopeful. Now what assurance do I have? Because that's one of the things I was asking for. What assurance, but however, I'm going to counter, what assurance do I have right now that my rates won't go up tomorrow? Zero. None. I would, I would suggest that if we don't do something with an inflation that's at 6.2%, 30% just with energy, it's 
it's up over 30% right now. It's much more likely that your rates are going to go up if we do nothing. So again, this, my amendment, uh, I hope will move the needle so that you, like Councillor Erickson and myself, aren't talking trash seven and a half years from now for, well, none of you will be here seven and a half years from now, but at the seven and a half year point in your, in your term as a, as a counselor. You know, I don't know that I agree with the system isn't, is, is broke or not broke. I do know that it needs improvement. You know, this moves the needle a little bit. You know, the bigger issue is the number of trucks that I see going down my street every day of the week. Multiple on Monday, multiple on Tuesday, it lightens up a little bit then the remainder of the week. You know, that's one of the issues that this council, after us, you're going to have to tackle. And it's not an easy, easy one, too. It, it would be, uh, we, we do need to improve on the efficiency. We do need to protect the environment. As a, as a biologist, I'm sensitive to that as well, too. So uh, I hope, uh, I, I appreciate the work that Councillor Neisser put into his amendment. I respect him for it. That's why I gave him the opportunity to go first this evening, because he had his amendment on the table last week before I had mine. I also realized that maybe next week I'm going to need his vote on another item, too. So I'm going to try to be fair and demonstrate that I can work with individuals on this council. I think I've done that in the past. I will continue to do that going in into the future as well, too. So again, uh, please uh, vote no on Councillor Neisert amendment and give my amendment the opportunity to be read into the record and then vote yes. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. All right, hmm. thank you, Councillor. Councillor Starr, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I think, Councillor Kiley, you have a great amendment and I'll probably support it at the end, but I won't support it as a compromise. I will support it as a uh, safeguard if we fail to pass Councillor Neitzert's amendment. It's something that we're gonna have to put in place, but where I think you might be missing in part of it is, is that you're guaranteeing two levels of service, but it's the charges that, that we're gonna see. If you forget to do valet service, what happens when you're out of town? Or I have to bring it to the curb starting on Friday for a Monday pickup. It's all the other things that go with that. I like that we have Travis's back and I think that does that, but we're still moving all those extra charges to the people who can least afford it. But to address your other concern that you said, you said there's no guarantee that your rates won't go up tomorrow. My rates actually dropped. I love my hauler. I, we called and asked for a larger container because we've added to our family and instead of packing it to the brim and hoping that by taking it to the curb they won't charge us for the extra bags and the things that are sitting on the street and potentially blowing over long periods of time, um, we got a larger can for almost $5 a month less. But the reason we got that is they were the ha highest price hauler in the city. So they've had to adjust to the market. And the guarantee that we have is the free market. And the free market isn't going to allow, I bet if you asked every hauler in this room, they don't think they can pass additional charges onto the community at this point because we'll switch haulers. And that's the, the, the great thing about capitalism is that we have that chance to do that. But what I'm concerned about is when haulers start threatening customers that if they don't take their cans to the curb, they're going to suspend their service. There was a hauler, at least one that printed uh, decals and put them on the cans and said, if you don't break the city ordinance the way it is right now, then we're going to suspend your service. That heavy handedness has no place in Sioux Falls. The other thing that um, this, this is incrementalism. With the type of service that we have, the proposed ordinance brings us to the point where we're going to have to cap haulers. And I think there is zero appetite on this council. And I think we've been very clear both to the solid waste planning um, advisory board, as well as the administration, that we're not interested in capping the number of haulers in our city. If we're not going to cap the number of haulers, we're not gonna solve the problem that most people are looking for. By allowing some people to take it to the curb to save a couple of bucks because they can do it, 
and remember it, and it'll end up costing them more than valet service because I'll bet you over the course of a quarter or three months, you're gonna forget at least once or twice and have those extra charges for not taking it to the curb. You're not gonna save money by bringing it to the curb. We do, I, Councilor Neitzert was very eloquent in pointing out that we do have community standards. We expect more in Sioux Falls. We want more for our community. We want to be on top of it. We want to have a sustainable community as well. We will see in a short amount of time the number of uh, trucks uh, decrease. We'll see electric uh, vehicles. We'll see natural gas. We'll see a number of things that the industry is going to do it. One last thing was probably the best example in this entire debate is that I had a neighbor say to me that if they hired a contractor to re-roof their house, they wouldn't expect the contractor to say to them, if it's, it's dangerous to get the shingles on the roof, so we'll re-roof your house, but you have to get the shingles on top of the roof or you have to strip the shingles from the house before we get to that point because we don't have the labor to do that part. And is it possible if I hauled the, the shingles to the top of my roof, I'd save a few bucks? But knowing my coordination, I'd have a lot more cost in uh, healthcare. So I, I think that, that sums this up and I think Councilor Neitzert's uh, amendment does a nice job of clarifying what our community standard is, cleaning up the language, allowing the free market to work and move forward and protect our most vulnerable citizens. Councilor Shelberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think Director Cotter put it well again this week where we have had a very thoughtful and healthy discussion and it's been going on for weeks. Um, I, I think Councilor Kiley and Councilor Neitzert, uh, very, I think Councilor Starr just said it well too, eloquent, well thought out. I mean, just, I think I've had endless discussions, especially between Councilor Neitzert and Councilor Kiley. Councilor Breck, he's had a lot of good points on this subject as well. I think it has been well thought out and we've looked at it from every which angle. I'm not going to go into all the same things I said last week. I think what it came down to for me, and um, I, I know Councilor Neitzer is on the right track and there's just so much about what he said that I agree with. And uh, it's the same with Councilor Kylie. I think I'm leaning just a bit towards Councilor Kylie at this point, just for the fact that it's a bit more flexible. It gives the consumer more choices. Um, and our system needs improvement. So is this perfect? It isn't. If we got all the answers tonight with what we're going to come up with, we don't. But I think we have to try to kind of move in the right direction. And to this, on this subject, after due diligence, homework hours, and listening to some very smart people who spent a lot of time and a lot of good angles in this, and I don't disagree with anybody that I'm, especially Councilor Neitzert, if I'm not necessarily going along with him, but in a way, on a lot of this stuff, I think that some of these things are pretty similar. But uh, um, yeah, I will be going along with Councillor Kylie's amendment this evening, but appreciate all the help and knowledge and things that everybody has shared with me on the subject through tonight. Thank you. Councillor Sale. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> this has been an interesting go-round for me because I certainly always thought the rules on the table were what we can now call valet. And what I found is that it was not being done that way, especially by the haulers. They ex a lot of them expected to come to the street. Well, that's a violation. That's against the law. But the way to fix that is not to find the garbage haulers. It's the homeowner that has to bear the brunt. So what I've heard from a lot of people is, don't make it so I have to turn in my neighbor. I don't want to rat them out just because I disagree with the way the rule is. I started this whole thing fully in support of Greg Neitzert's amendment. But as time goes, I realize it's probably not going to work if we put it in. I know there's 14, 13 or 14 haulers in the city. So when we talk about we're not going to be able to run our business, geez, somebody else is going to pick it up. If we had one hauler that's told us they couldn't do it because of the labor shortage, I might, that might, uh, argument might have some legs with me. But when there's 14 haulers wanting to get business in Sioux Falls, I don't see that the labor shortage is that big an issue versus being a carpenter, versus being an electrician, because all those people are short too at this time. I certainly sympathize with the young lady that talked about trash in her neighborhood and people <coughs> just letting it fall all over. Well, 
if you're going to do that with your garbage, I wonder how short you actually cut your lawn or do you pick up your dog droppings when you take them for a, a walk. So that's more of a personality issue, I think, at that time. I certainly have picked up my neighbor's garbage from time to time when it's been windy, and I'm, people have done that for me. I couldn't tell you who my hauler is today. My wife made that decision, and she pays the bills, but they have never once asked me to move my garbage from the side of the house to the curb. I am not elderly yet. I am not disabled yet. But I want my garbage picked up by the side of my house because I do travel and I am gone and I want it brought back so that I don't have to worry about it. So when somebody says we're going to make accommodations for elderly and disabled, I'm not that, but I still want valet service. So that's why I evolved in this position from being right beside Greg Neitzer to slightly moving over more to where Rick Kiley is today. So that's the way my vote's going to be. But I will say... Garbage in Sioux Falls is going to continue to be an issue in front of this council. And as Councilor Starr and others have said, we might have to go farther with regulation. Today, there has been talk of posting on the city websites all the rates for the haulers so that citizens could make those decisions. I'm not saying we're going to go there, but that has been a discussion. There has been a discussion about segmenting the city off. There has been a discussion about capping licenses. All those things are going to be talked about in the future. So unfortunately, Councillor Kiley, you probably will have to come back in seven and a half years to talk garbage to the next group of councillors. That's where I stand. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Brecky and then Councillor Erickson. Several years ago, um, the health department told me, they said, a city's garbage contains all of the germs of the entire city. And I thought that was appropriate to repeat tonight because this is a serious topic that we're talking about. That's really serious. How a city disposes of its garbage is how it keeps itself clean and safe in many ways and germ-free. And we have been fortunate over the years in this city to have a clean city in many ways. And there's many layers to our cleanliness and we've been rewarded for that. We're a tree city. Um, the Sioux Falls Downtown Association hires people to clean up the, the litter every day. They come out and clean up the downtown. Our property owners are incredibly responsible that, that own multi-housing and, and um, multiple units in cleaning up this city and keeping it clean. And the city over the years has, has shown a very strong commitment to cleanliness. And part of it was, one of the layers of it was the way that we developed this free market system to create a high level of competition to get the highest standard of service for the best price. And we did more than that. We also created Projects Nice and Projects Keep that we move around neighborhoods in order to keep the neighborhoods especially clean when they get, when they get kind of distressed. And so the city has done a lot, the private sector has done a lot, and we have a beautiful clean city. And for me, uh, the issue is not so much an issue of personal choice as an issue of how do we best keep this layer of cleanliness, you know, that was added part of multiple layers that as a whole makes for a very clean city. And I think it's so important because I would never, never, never underestimate the value of cleanliness and how it contributes to safety and crime prevention. Clean neighborhoods, clean streets, clean properties, cleanliness in general, beauty in general, is probably the single most, other than law enforcement personnel, the single most, most effective tool to keep a city safe from criminal activity and gang activity. And so for me, the vote is with Greg Neitzer's amendment because I, I don't want to remove any layers at a time when 
You know, crime is continually knocking at our back door trying to get in. And I do believe, because we still have the free market system, that when you allow the vehicles, you know, of the multiple users to go into the neighborhoods and remove the garbage on all kinds of different days, we're going to have what I describe as this polka dot, this polka dot of garbage cans all, all, all across the city, dotted with garbage cans all across the entire city, higgly-piggly, all across the entire city. And we're going to move to that from what we've had. What we've had, all we needed was just a little public education and, and a little more zealous enforcement to return ourselves to our original standards. And that's what you know, Council Members Neitzert's amendment does. He's put in the corrective language to make sure that it's all of the waste that has to be brought and returned. And so I, I don't want to go through this diatribe without also saying a, a big, big thank you to the haulers for all these years of providing this amazing standard of service. And I hear what you're saying but I just can't give it up as a, as a recipient of it. And I can't give up the idea that we're starting to shed you know, some of our cleanliness and that I believe it's going to have a more um, significant impact on our distressed neighborhoods because in our distressed neighborhoods, they've already have problems with keeping their, yard, their trees trimmed and their grass you know, clipped and their sidewalks shoveled. And that's why they become a distressed neighborhood and their, their properties are closer together. And so now you're gonna have exactly what um, one of our citizens, Nancy Lefson, showed us tonight. You're gonna have that really bad in those neighborhoods that are already hurting. They're, they're very much likely to be in worse shape because those are the people that are working the shifts and working the weekends and probably aren't gonna be taking their cans back and forth. And those are, were some of the people that, we were, that were being discussed you know, at the Solid Waste Planning Board that they were, you know, concerned about by setting the 36-hour period that cans can be out, which means literally cans can be out all the time when you consider all the different haulers. So you're going to have a polka-dotted community of garbage cans out every day, all day, everywhere. It just depends on how many haulers are in that neighborhood. Some will be better than others, but there's a good chance that, you know, some will really look badly like the ones that we saw the photographs of tonight. And so I just, uh, with, you know, I, I appreciate, you know, the council and how they've handled this. I appreciate the haulers and what they've done for us over the years. I'm begging them to figure out a way. I'm hoping for technology and other ways to save them money, you know, maybe in the electric vehicles, maybe in, in um, natural gas, whatever's coming our way you know, that in, in an innovative world, but I, I just can't give up um, the cleanliness issue. I think it's so, so important. And so I will be supporting Councilor Nightman's amendment. Councilor Erickson. Thank you. Um, I'll be as brief as possible. Just want to make some clarifying points. One, I support freedom of speech, and I am so grateful that each and every one of you have um, access to whether it's coming here, going to Solid Waste Board, emailing text, whatever it is. Um, so much of the dialogue is more than what you're seeing right here. And I know the statement was made, did you read all of those? Did you read all of this? We do. We read it all. A lot of times we divide and conquer. We all have separate jobs out here. We all serve on probably two or three, four, five other boards as well. And so the purpose of having a solid waste board is for it to be vetted through. We have a public transit board. I mean, later you'll see all these other boards that we're appointing to, and we utilize those as a council that ultimately we serve, whether you're in a district or not, we serve the constituency of the city limits of Sioux Falls, period, end of story. We answer to the citizens, each and every one of you, whether you have a business, whether you have garbage service, whether your homeowner pays for it or your landlord pays for it, Everyone has an opinion and we support that. So I, I find it unfortunate that the statement is made that we don't do our homework or we're not talking about it. I tell you what, I've had more conversations on garbage in the last week than I've had on cannabis and we're giving cannabis licenses tomorrow. I mean, who knew, right? Um, it's just, it's, this council has really taken a thoughtful approach with talking to each other, trying to figure out um, what makes the most sense, protecting a service that we 
we have to have. You may get rid of your cable service tomorrow, but you have to have garbage. Those pictures, they're horrible. You know what the problem is? They need a bigger garbage can. That's the problem. I had, I recently upgraded to two, um, I have a family of five. I upgraded to two recycling bins. We recycle everything in our house and that's our, our thing. Instead of doing two garbage cans, we do two recycle cans and then we have a large garbage can. And it's still, I feel bad. If there's stuff in there, I'll take it to one of our rentals and throw it in there if there's room. But you cannot have overflowing garbage. That's the way, that, that's why it blows around. Get a garbage can that's a little bit bigger. Cost you $3 more and it will, it will pay off. I think that's really, really important. We do have 60 boards. I don't go to all 60 meetings. So my point with that is the purpose of the boards is for them to vet, come forward, present, and then ultimately that decision is made for this, this council. I also just want to be very clear that um, clean also means less noise and less emissions. It's just not the appearance, but it's also the noise of trucks, the noise on the streets the emissions. We need you to be able to do your jobs and that, but we also need to be mindful that if we can give you another route to, to get to the cans quicker and get off the streets, I think that's an option. I personally, I don't mind taking it down to, to the curb when I'm in town, but I travel. So for me personally, I would probably want the, the service that you come and get it and bring it down, but those times I can bring it down, I'll do it for you. I have no problem. It's just we travel so much with kids sports that I don't want to miss my garbage because they'll look like those pictures because I'll miss my, I'll miss my week. Um, and so for me, it's been back and forth and back and forth and where do I land? I know uh, I've reached out to Mark Cotter, he's reached out to me and sometimes I didn't return his calls and went a little silent because I needed to process where I was with each of these two amendments and really three, we've got three options on the table, what's in front of us and the other two amendments. And so. Um, Truly, at the end of wherever this lands, we're going to rely on the city and, and those haulers to communicate to us, your customers. We will need you to communicate what that standard is um, of what you expect of, hey, here's two options, pick a box, and we'll go forward with that. But we, we will need your support in working in a collaborative manner uh, for that communication as we move forward. And use utilize the city. I think that uh, Mark Cotter's done a really good job of um, having a, a good relationship with you um, and, and making sure we can do that. So I appreciate all the countless hours that every single person has put in this, whether you're a constituent, giving public input, whether you're a hauler, whether you're elected, whether you work for the city. It, it, it has really been a lot going into something. And, you know, like we said, seven, years, seven and a half years ago, how emotional garbage can be, be at that time we were talking about where you could put your garbage cans and that language was going to be changed and oh my goodness it was it was really crazy then too and so it's an emotional issue we're we're talking about a, a convenience um, but I do lean more towards having the options of two services um, as we move forward so that's kind of where I land on this and um, again uh, thank you for everyone who has spoke up Councilor Knights, your last word, then we're going to vote on your amendment. Thank you. Uh, just to um, my, my final pitch, m my amendment is the only amendment uh, with respect that preserves, preserves the neighborhood beauty and the community standard. Uh, the city's option and the other amendment um, get, give that away. We, we have strong court enforcement and zoning in our neighborhoods because we want them to meet a certain standard and a certain beauty, and it does cost uh, people money and it does restrict what they can do, but we've decided that as a community, that is more important uh, for the common good uh, than to let people do uh, whatever they want. I mean, there's a lot of other things. For example, we could tell people that you don't really have to mow your lawn because you know it might be cheaper not to mow your lawn, but we make them mow their lawn. Um, so it, I would just urge you, uh, just, just support this amendment uh, without this amendment, uh, we, we give up a community standard that we've had for many years, and it's really a shame. Thanks. All right. I think we're ready to vote on uh, Councilor Knight's amendment here. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? No. Jensen? No. Kylie? No. Knightsert? Yes. Selberg? No. Sale? No. 
All right, the amendment fails five to three. So we're back to the uh, main motion then uh, on the floor. And Councillor Kiley, you want to officially read your uh, amendment into the record? Yes, I will. And I'll try to do so without adding all the scribbled notes that I have on my page here. <laughs> Um, I make uh, I, I move to amend by entitling section 57.024 as levels of collection service required with the following section text all commercial garbage haulers as a condition of licensure under 57.065 must offer a minimum of two levels of service as follows a curbside service. Under curbside service, collection service occurs at the place designated for collection in 57.023B above. It is the owner, occupant, or manager's responsibility to move or cause to be moved all containers to and from this designated place <laughs> in accordance with 57.023. B, valet service. Under valet service, collection service occurs at the structure. The owner, occupant, or manager places all containers directly adjacent to the structure in a place reasonably accessible to the commercial garbage hauler. It is the commercial garbage hauler's responsibility to retrieve the containers from and return the containers to this location on collection day. At the owner, occupant or manager's discretion, placement of containers for collection may be the same as their non-collection day placement so long as the containers are adjacent to the structure and reasonably accessible to the hauler. All right, so that's the motion. Do we have a second for second, that? Second, Jensen. All right, motion by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Jensen. Discussion on this motion. Very briefly, I'll, I'll just try to reiterate what I'd stated before. This does give the consumer a choice, and really this is more is directed more to the consumer than it is to, to the haulers, because I am convinced that we do need to bring efficiencies to this system. Otherwise, we are going to see rates go up. We're going to see infrastructure damaged. We're going to see an impact on our environment. There's so many different things that are, that are at play. Um, Councillor Starr actually helped make my point. I really do hope that the free market rules in this case, that if somebody raises their rates, they're concerned that they're going to go and select another hauler. That will apply to this amendment equally. And regarding the suspension of service, if, if a customer is threatened with a suspension of service, uh, that hauler would be in direct violation of the condition of their license. They would risk losing their license, they would risk uh, their, their company, they would risk uh, their livelihood. So again, I uh, respectfully request your support on this amendment. All right, thank you. Councillor Neitzert? Yeah, I, I, I'm a little torn. I, I, I may support it. I guess the only thing, you know, as I just kind of think it through, um, I mean, it, it I like it in theory, it sounds good in theory. That being said, there's um, obviously nothing as it regards to uh, pricing, although we don't, we don't mandate pricing as it is already. But with multiple haulers, I guess I would submit that with competition and the haulers out there, um, there's gonna be somebody that's gonna provide uh, valet, valet service. So um, I, I guess I'm just only torn by whether it's more feel good than anything. And I mean that with all respect. I, I just, that's the only struggle I have. All right, other discussion on this item here? Councilor Starr, go ahead. Yes, and maybe a question for Councilor Kiley, if I can. One, it was insinuated about notice of the amendments. Just, could you share where you notice the amendment to give people? I'm sure it's on our website and where, but I don't want to speak for you, but I want you, people to understand that it there was, was out no there for people. There was no public notice of the amendment until this evening. Does that answer your question, Councilor? No, that, absolutely, because that's where you know we've gone through this with amendments as, as part of it of notice and who doesn't have notice, and, and maybe their point was valid that they didn't know what was coming. So, and being able to to respond to that. So, if I, I think could I'm just, following probably the suit that uh, you've laid out for us on many occasions previously. Well, I'd be happy to Thank take you. credit Thank for you. it. Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. I try to hide as much stuff as I can from the public. All you, have, the time. you have a follow up, Councilor? Yes, Starr? absolutely. 
Um, the other thing that uh, we talked about um, that's come up as part of this uh, is that it is tough for sometimes for consumers. Uh, one example, a, a former member of this body continued to call me through this process. And one of the things that he had gotten as a, a comment for his threats of suspending his service was, well, just change haulers. Well, he had changed haulers three times and still ends up with the same large company who keeps buying up the, the, the customers. So it's really hard to stay with a, a smaller independent company if that's your choice as part of it. So I, I, I think it's there. But I did say this earlier, and I did. I think this is at least a partial safeguard. Um, I would encourage people to check their bills. That's how we started this process in the beginning and, and where some of the... Uh, um, uh, happen is that people don't know what they just have automatic withdrawal from their ACH and they didn't realize they were paying penalties or that their rates had gone up and the things that change. So it is on the consumer to continue to take a look and it is uh, to be able to do that. I think Councillor Sale made a good point earlier tonight um, that we do have to be good consumers. I think we'll be back at this. I think we'll see some things that we're going to have to fix from the dais and, and we'll continue to probably talk about trash every couple of years as we see things and continue to protect our community to be the great place that it is. So, thank you. Other discussion, Council? Councilor Brackey? Um, I will be supporting this amendment. I, I, I'm glad that there was at least a second option if people weren't willing to go along with um, leaving our same standard in place. But I would just, I would just reiterate my only concern, Councilor Kiley, is that it, that cleanliness issue is is really I think really important and it this doesn't really address that um, that polka dot thing that that happens as a result of our free market system so um, we probably do have some more work to do but um, I do appreciate your efforts in in bringing this forward thank you all right all right I think uh, looks like we're ready to take a vote on Councilor Kylie's amendment please Council Member Starr yes Brecky yes Erickson yes Jensen yes Kylie yes Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Okay, the amendment passes 8-0. Back to the main motion as amended. Uh, any discussion on that now? Hearing none, let's take a vote on the main motion as amended. Council Member Starr? No. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? No. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right. Passes six to two. Move on to our next item, please. Item 31, second reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the code of ordinances of the city by amending chapter 160, zoning, sub, sub chapter definitions. The planning commission recommends approval seven to zero. Sponsors, council members, Kylie and Erickson. Uh, okay. Are you guys gonna speak to that as the sponsors? I saw that. It's all right. It's all right. Sorry. <laughs> everyone, everyone need a stretch break maybe after that? It was just more trash talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Okay. Again, during the recent discussion on medical marijuana, I mentioned it was my intention to bring a, uh, an amendment uh, relating uh, forward relating to sensitive uses. And the proposed ordinance uh, would amend the definition of sensitive use by removing places of worship from the definition when it exists within a commercially zoned area. Uh, this amendment ensures businesses which are limited by sensitive use restrictions are not adversely impacted by a place of worship that chose to locate in a strip mall or retail uh, building. So, and the uh, ordinance also includes updates recommended by planning. And I'll let uh, Mr. Bieber address some of those as well as maybe some other uh, aspects of this. Yeah, as indicated in the first reading, really, it's uh, taking the place of worship, uh, that sensitive land use out of commercial and office and industrial zoning district, uh, still protecting them for uh, places of worship in residential areas, as in the picture in the upper right. And then the other change is really uh, defining what a public use facility is, um, just getting it down to, to what actual uses we're looking for. So, All right. Anyone from the public here to speak on this item tonight? All right, Council, you have any questions for the sponsors, or let's just get a motion on the floor. Move to approve. Second, Erickson. All right, motion by Kylie, seconded by Erickson. Discussion or questions for the sponsors, Council? 
All right, hearing none, let's take a vote on this, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 32, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by amending Chapter 111, Alcoholic Beverages. Recommendation, set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. Sponsor is the Mayor. Jamie, you're making you stay late for a meeting. Huh? <laughs> Welcome. Good evening. Jamie Palmer with Licensing. This ordinance is before you tonight um, to request to set the full service restaurant on sale liquor license fee as well as the on sale liquor license fee. Um, state law mandates that the fee set for both of these license types is not less than $1 per person according to the last um, federal um, census. And as many of you probably know, the federal census for um, Sioux Falls came in at 192,517. Um, therefore, the proposal um, is requesting that the full service restaurant on sale license is set at the minimum, which is a dollar per person, 192,517 and the on-sale dealer license be set at $240,646,000. The reason for that um, is, historically speaking, that license type for the on-sale um, fee has been set at $1.25 per person, um, according to the last decennial census. All right, thank you, Jamie. Uh, anyone from the public wish to speak on this item tonight? Uh, Councillors, do you have any questions for Jamie on this one? <clears throat> Councillor Selberg, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, Jamie, how did we get to this place where it seems like we're almost, a, for lack of a better term, kind of all of a sudden we're flooding the market with licenses, it seems. We've just got all these 18, 19. How did we get to this position? Um, if you're asking why we have so many available right now? Yes. Um, I, it is, it's generated by the growth. Okay, so it all came up just like, so 10 years ago, did we have the same type of spurt? Yes. So um, I looked back at records. Um, the 2010 census um, came in at 153,888, um, which made um, 12 additional retail liquor licenses and 31 additional package liquor licenses at that time. Okay. So the, the process that we'll go through now with these will be similar to what we did then as far as distributing or will things be, I, I think some questions have been asked, well, what's the process now? So do we have a process in place for how they'll be distributed and moved along and we've done this before? Okay, so the, the current process that is in place right now is there is a waiting list um, and I believe um, there is 19 license, additional licenses that have been made available with our census numbers. Um, the, the waiting list that we have right now has 18 people on that. And so I will have to work my way through that waiting list. Um, and, and then at the end, I'm sure there's going to be at least one available. Um, and a new process to issue that license will need to be developed. Okay. And I believe that is in discussion phases to get that done. What kind of timeline do you think we're looking at here to get the 18 out and move through this? And so, I, because of state law that they can't be sold for less than a dollar per person, mandates that we have to have the price increase done before I can start offering to those on the list. Um, normal process for for the list um, is, you know, of course, I call the first person and tell them a license is available, and that that triggers a timeline that they have to adhere to, um, such as. Uh, if they accept the license, they, I will send them a checklist, and then they have 45 days to get that back to me. And that um, checklist determines if the property is suitable for on-sale use. Um, once that is determined, then that starts the next flag. Then they have, um, if they, say, if they need a conditional use permit, then they have to start that process and finish that before um, 
before I tell them that, okay, payment is due on this date, payment and application. If a conditional use permit isn't needed, then they have 60 days from that date that I tell them a conditional use permit is not needed to pay that license fee and submit that application. So it's a little bit different depending on what they need to do, um, the timeline, but as any one timeline can take 45 plus 60, whatever, 105 days. Okay. Well, thanks for walking me through all that. I appreciate sure. it. Other sure. questions for Jamie while we have her here? Okay. Oh, this one. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor Erickson, go ahead. I just want to make it clear that uh, some folks said, well, how can you, you know, raise the, the price to the folks that are on the wait list? And that price is never guaranteed. When they enter that wait list, there's never price guarantee. We as a council can never go below that dollar per person per census at a minimum. But when we walked through the restaurant license stuff, you saw how semi-controversial that was, that um, at, at any time, this council can raise it to two bucks a person. They can raise it to $1.50, whatever, whatever the council and or mayor with the vote wants to do can happen. And so there's no guarantee for anybody on that list. You're simply saying, hey, I wanna be in line to buy one of those. And when that time comes, are you, are you ready? If you're not, you can skip it and go to the next one or however that works. But we do have that one extra and that will be the key to, to moving that forward and getting that process in place as far as what will work for the longevity of, of sustaining that. So um, thank you, Jamie, for bringing um, this forward. Uh, I think it's, I think that the dollar amount makes sense. We technically didn't increase the rate. We kept the rate the same. It's just, it grew with the census and so Maybe I'm splitting hairs a little bit there, but in my opinion, it just stayed with that census number uh, and there's no price guarantee. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you, Councillor. All right, I'd look for a motion. That would be to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7. So moved, Jensen. Second, Erickson. All right, motion by Jensen, seconded by Erickson. Any discussion there? All right, Mr. Mayor? Uh, Councillor Starr, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I, one of my uh, questions probably for second reading and we'll do a little more investigating is that we're talking about $3.8 million worth of new licensing fees and where those funds go. Do we put that money towards uh, alcohol treatment or the things, the dangers that alcohol does do in our community? Do we do some kind of prevention activity or does it just get out, rolled up in the cogs of government of how that money's invested and what we do with it? And I think that's probably part of the discussion that we should have as we allocate money where where we think that that additional money that we only get every 10 years. The second thing is, is one of my concerns is that um, we should probably be selling these licenses close to the market rate. And the market is bearing closer to 400 or 450,000 when you look at the last transfers, at least if you, we have no official way to know what that number is because we don't require it to be reported, might be a place where we need to continue to to look at uh, some of those reporting when we transfer it. We could ask for that information when we transfer the license. I think that we could possibly do that as a city ordinance. But I think when we sell them under the market value, then we devalue the, the folks that have already purchased them in the past. And they've become an investment tool for a lot of businesses that their license is, in a lot of cases, uh, their retirement. Um, when they sell their license and sell their business. So I think that's something that, again, is part of the overall mix of what we should be looking at and, and at least discussing in this part of this group. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, let's take a vote on this. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale. Yes. All right, that one passes eight to zero. We'll move on to item 33. Item 33, first reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota rezoning property located at 720 East Maple Street from the I-1 Light Industrial District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban District, number 15134-2021, and amending the official zoning map of the city of Sioux Falls. The Planning Commission recommends approval five to zero. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. Private applicant, Galtel Properties, LLC, Vincent Pertel. Uh, the applicant and owner here is Vincent Pertel. It's located at 720 East Maple Street. It's about 0.53 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is we're looking at matching the correct uh, zoning with the current use of the property. It's been a single family home for some time. Thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on item 33? 
All right, Council, got any questions for Jason on this one? All right, look for a motion to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7. Move approval. Second, Erickson. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Erickson. Discussion there? All right, let's vote on that, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Next item. Item 34, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning portion of property located at 4501 West 85th Street from the LW Live Work RA3 apartment residential high density, RA1 apartment residential low density, and RD2 townhome residential suburban districts to the RA3 apartment residential high density and CN conservation districts, number 15194-2021, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval five to zero. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. Private applicant, advanced engineering and environmental services. Uh, the applicant and owner here is Joel Dykes with RMB Associates. Uh, it's located south of West 85th Street and east of South Tallgrass Avenue. It's about 16.69 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is they're looking uh, to zone their uh, on-site detention ponds to the CN Conservation District. All right, thank you, Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on this one? Council, any questions here? All right, look for a motion to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7. So moved. Second, Neitzer. All right, motion by Kylie, seconded by Neitzer. Any discussion? All right, let's vote on that one, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 35, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at the northeast corner of Madison Street and Veterans Parkway from the C3 Commercial Community District to the S1 General Institutional District, number 15196-2021, and amending the official zone and map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 5-0. to zero. Recommendation, set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. Private applicant, advanced engineering and environmental services. Uh, the owner here is also Joel Dykes with R&B Associates. It's located at the northwest corner of East Madison Street and uh, North Veterans Parkway. It's about 12.45 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is they're looking at constructing a Sanford clinic on the 12 acres. All right. Thank you, sir. Anyone from the public here to speak on this one? Any questions, Council, for Jason? I look for a motion to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7. So moved, Erickson. Second. Motion by Erickson, seconded by Selberg. Any discussion there? Let's vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Next item. Item 36, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning portion of property located at 7500 South Audi Avenue from the LW Live Work and C3 Commercial Community Districts to the LW Live Work and CN Conservation Districts number 15251-2021 and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 5-0. to zero. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7th, 2021. Private applicant, Schulte Real Estate LLC, Mike Schulte. Uh, the applicant and owner here is Mike Schulte. It's located north of West 85th Street and east of South Audi Avenue. It's about 2.76 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is they're also looking to zone their areas that they're going to use for their stormwater detention to the CN Conservation District. Thank you, sir. Anyone from the public here to speak on this one? Counselors, do you have any questions for Jason here? Move approval. Second, Kylie. All right, motion by Selberg, seconded by Kylie to set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7. Any discussion? Let's vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Item 37. Item 30. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Sale. I need to recuse myself from this item. All right, you're out. Item 37, first reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 100 South Grange Avenue from the RT1 single-family residential traditional district to the C2 commercial neighborhood and streetcar district, number 15272-2021, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 6-0. to zero. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7, 2021. Private applicant, Cook Hazard Architects, Keith Thompson. Uh, the applicant is Keith Thompson with Coke Hazard. The owner is Alex Hellback. 
Uh, it's located at the southeast corner of West 9th Street and South Grange Avenue. It's about 0.15 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is the applicant is looking to convert the first floor of this existing building into a coffee shop, and then he's also looking to do the second floor into some office space. A neighborhood meeting was held on October 27th excuse me, at the downtown library. Uh, we had about 25 people, representatives from Pettigrew and Cathedral, Cathedral neighborhoods. Uh, questions were answered by the applicant, and both neighborhoods' voices support for the project and also uh, support at the Planning Commission meeting for the project. All right, thanks, Jason. Anyone from the public here to speak on this one tonight? The president of the Pedigree Neighborhood Association. The meeting went very well, but like I addressed to the mayor, and I don't care because I'm sure I'm just bottling his, his, his blood, right? And who cares? Because when I was put into this neighborhood association, I was put in by 3,900 people, 852 properties. So if I have to put the city in their place, this is what we're going to do, because this is what Pettigrew wants, right? To hold the city accountable. We need to, the mayor needs to address Jason Bieber and them. We do not silence people to talk. We let them know about the first reading to come to council and the second reading, not just the second reading. Again, this happened again in information with tall grass, and I done said this to y'all. I don't have any issues about the meeting. It was very run productively. But when I ask at the meeting, when is the city council meetings for this? Do not have the city throw up the number in its second reading. Because when it's second reading, it's all said and done with. I keep telling y'all to pay attention on y'all's first and second readings and how many people come here and don't come here. I have trust in the mayor that he's going to take care of this issue. I lived it. I saw it. I was there. Nobody can tell me different. Alex Hallback has, is spending his own money. You know, I mean, people that got money, rich people, whatever, I don't care who it is. They don't have to spend money in the neighborhood. They don't, he could take his million dollars that he wants to invest in this property of his own money, and he could go anywhere else. He can go to T. Brandon anywhere with this property to make it a coffee shop or that. Do I have trust in Alex that he's not gonna put a fly by night tenant in here? Yes. Do I think that the neighborhood is gonna be satisfied with who is going to be in here if it will be a coffee shop and a little lunch place or whatever, a little restaurant? Yes, I do trust in him for that. Not too many people do I trust and come up here and say yes, that, 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 but I do trust it in his, out of his mouth that what he's planning on doing is going to be set in stone. And again, this is why I got voted for the Neighborhood Association to make sure things are run right. So we need to work on, when we have neighborhood association meetings, that the mayor, not council, the mayor, make sure that everything is run correctly in these neighborhood associations with his employees, and that communication for first and second reading, not just second reading, is told to the public. All right, anyone else here to speak on this item tonight? Good evening. Hello, everyone, um, and I'll be brief tonight, uh, Mayor, Council. My name is Alex Hallback. I'm the owner of Boulevard Properties, um, the company that owns this cute little building up on Grange. Um, I am, uh, I'm a strong believer, as some of you may know, I'm, I'm also the president of the Board of Historic Preservation, and I think that properties like this throughout the city are really important. Um, they're important for a lot of reasons, one of which is is preserving the use of these, these old great buildings that exist kind of scattered throughout neighborhoods in the city of Sioux Falls. Um, my proposal is to um, bring in a, a restaurant coffee shop operator on the main floor and a small office tenant for the second floor of this building. I'm also proposing that there be a rooftop patio added to the building as well. Um, we, I did hold a neighborhood meeting um, that were um, the neighbors were supportive of the project, and I just, I, I wanted to come up here. I, I don't want to take more of your time, but just wanted to come up and introduce myself and, and make myself available if you have questions. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks a lot, Alex. Anyone else here to speak on this item? All right. Let's, uh, 
Let's uh, get a motion on the floor if we can. Set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7. So move moved. to approve. Second, Brecky. All right, I think uh, Councilor Neitzer moved that, seconded by Councilor Brecky, I believe. Um, any discussion on this one? Councilor Neitzer, go ahead. I, I just love to see a return to things like this of neighborhood services where you can have uh, uh, low scale commercial and, and it can work in a neighborhood. So I think it's gonna be, it's kind of like the pizza shop over by USF, so which has been mm -hmm. a big, big hit. So uh, thanks for doing it. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, take a vote on this one, please. Council member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. All right, that one passes seven to zero. Before we move to 38, Councilor Jensen, you wanna knock on the door and get Councilor Sale? All right, and we will move on to 38. Item 38, first reading, an ordinance of the city of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approving offer to purchase real estate from the city. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7, 2021. Private applicant, Connolly Properties, LLC. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Dustin Powers, Planning and Development Services. Uh, tonight's ordinance would authorize the mayor to enter into a purchase agreement uh, to sell uh, city property located at 1608 West 51st Street uh, to Connolly Properties, LLC. Uh, the property is, uh, the subject property is re the remaining remnant of the old ice and rec uh, facility in South Central Sioux Falls near the intersection of West Avenue and West 51st Street. Over the past few years, uh, the city has conveyed land to the Glory House to support their mission uh, to provide housing for the, uh, those who struggle with addiction and mental health problems and need additional assistance. The city has also conveyed uh, property to the uh, uh, east of this subject site uh, to Connolly Properties to support their expansion of the Culligan Water operations here in Sioux Falls. Uh, during the plan review, uh, when uh, uh, Culligan brought their plan review to start construction on the land we had already sold. Uh, it was determined uh, that stormwater treatment, uh, so detention on site, was going to be required to support uh, their uh, improvements. Following um, some uh, follow-up conversations with the Glory House and their future expansions of the housing that they're proposing for phase two of their uh, expansion, they would also need some detention to support their future development. And so, um, uh, basically, Connolly Properties came forward with an offer to purchase the property in order to uh, develop a detention pond on the remaining remnant that would support the future expansion of Culligan, as well as the future expansion of the Glory House operations uh, for the future housing, uh, phase two of their housing project. Uh, so the purchase agreement terms are with Connolly Properties, LLC. Uh, the property to be sold is about 14,000 square feet. The total purchase price is 59,000. Uh, substantial completion is tied to their um, uh, already approved agreement that they have with us uh, uh, with for their expansion of uh, the Culligan um, operations. So that's agreement listed there. Again, if those um, improvements don't happen, uh, we still have a repurchase option in the agreement. And again, this supports uh, an agreement that's entered into and is an exhibit of this purchase agreement that's between Glory House and Connolly Properties. And we've also received a letter of support from Glory House to uh, the city uh, supporting this purchase agreement. So with that, I uh, would be asking for setting a date of second reading for December 7th uh, for this purchase agreement. Thank you. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this item? Counselors, questions? I'll move to, sorry, I'll move to set the second reading for Tuesday, December 7th. Second. Moved by Erickson, second by Kylie. Can we have a roll call vote, or discussion, please? Seeing none, vote please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. The motion passes eight to zero. Next item, please. Item 39, first reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approving offer to purchase real estate from the city. Recommendation set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December 7, 2021. Private applicant, First Avenue Partners, LLC. Dustin Powers of Planning Development Services again. Uh, this ordinance would authorize the mayor uh, to enter into a purchase agreement for the city to sell land located at 400 South First Avenue to First Avenue Partners, LLC. Uh, the subject property is located in downtown Sioux Falls at the intersection of South First Avenue and West 12th Street. 
Um, and as discussed in recent weeks, this property is currently a city-owned surface parking lot that's been managed by our public parking system. Uh, in order to achieve a, a higher and better use for the property, the property was made available for redevelopment in which proposals were submitted. Uh, First Avenue Partners LLC submitted the most advantageous uh, project to the city. Um, the Parking Advisory Board did review the project and uh, has uh, recommended approval that this be brought forward and uh, that the city uh, entertain an agreement for the sale and redevelopment of this site. <coughs> the project uh, that's been submitted uh, will be a minimum of four stories and provide at least 150 residential units uh, to the downtown market. It will also include 5,000 square feet of retail space located at the corner of 12th Street and 1st Avenue. Uh, this uh, really is being able to be achieved, the, the, the density as well as the square footage is being able to achieve, be achieved by the developer by them uh, having the ability to assemble the adjacent properties to the east uh, in order to uh, create, again, the density that we're seeing. Uh, this view of the property is actually from the 12th Street Plaza, so looking uh, to the southeast from the 12th Street Plaza. Uh, the next view here is basically standing around the post office uh, looking towards uh, the southwest. So on your left would be South 2nd Avenue, and on your right would be 12th Street. And then this would be a, an overhead view uh, looking uh, at the building kind of on the north, uh, looking northeast from the back side of the building, just illustrating the residential amenities that would be added uh, to support the 150 units that would be added to the project. So again, uh, purchase agreement uh, terms would be that this would be with First Avenue Partners LLC. The property being sold is tw roughly 20,000 square feet at 400 South First Avenue. The total purchase price is $542,000, which is the full appraised price for the property. Closing would occur by April 1st of, that should say, 2022. Um, commencement would be within 12 months of the approval dates if this would be approved. Uh, completion within 36 months and again we have a repurchase option if the development doesn't occur uh, so again with that we do have representatives of first avenue uh, partners llc here tonight and uh, we are asking for a second reading to be scheduled for december 7th dustin thank you all right anyone from the public here to speak on item uh, 38 tonight good evening good evening joe bachelor president of downtown sioux falls on behalf of the DTSF board, I urge your support on this uh, ordinance as it will facilitate this development that will bring much needed housing to downtown. Also will invigorate uh, downtown with some street level activity. This is an area that has developed into a nice little sub-district of downtown. And uh, this development would serve as a great anchor to further along the identity of this sub-district. So with that, I urge your support. Thank you. All right, thanks Joe. Anyone else here to speak on item 38, come on up. Good evening. Good evening, thank you all um, for considering our offer to purchase this property. Uh, my name is Luke Justin with Lloyd Companies, um, representing First Avenue Partners. Um, we've proposed, as Dustin pointed out, um, all the stats on the, the project, and I did want to acknowledge for all of you that um, we know that parking's been a concern um, on this project. So. Uh, that's in, in a way by design. Uh, we believe that uh, the parking provided on this um, property is sufficient for, for the use of it. Um, will there be a need for some offsite parking? Absolutely, but we believe that uh, the way we've designed this, those individuals that are looking to uh, pay a little bit less for parking um, will seek parking elsewhere. Uh, it's in a great location downtown. Um, with easy access to grocery, with easy access to a pharmacy, to a clinic, um, a host of different employers. Uh, and we believe that downtown is uh, beginning to be ready for individuals who may not have a car, um, that they can get every, everywhere they need and uh, function within um, society without uh, the use of transportation um, by automobile. So we appreciate your consideration and we are happy to answer any questions that you all may have. All right, thanks, Luke. Thank you. Anyone else from the public here to speak on item 38? All right, counselors, do you have any questions for Dustin uh, or for uh, the applicant here? Yes. Counselor Stargo, hey. Thank you, Luke, if I could, I just, a, a couple of questions. <clears throat> One of the concerns, you know, we keep talking about density in downtown Sioux Falls. 
were you limited by the parking that you couldn't go another level or two levels or 10 levels some people are suggesting with housing through downtown what what was kind of was it the parking that was the limiting factor or where could that you could have even went denser with a, a project coming forward yeah there there's several reasons when we're designing a project that uh, play into the factor of how dense we can get um, in, in this situation, yeah, parking is a limiting factor. Um, downtowns across the nation, we're seeing uh, that parking limits are being lowered or even eliminated. Uh, I don't think Sioux Falls is quite there that no parking would be needed on a project, and we feel like this is a good start uh, for limiting parking. Um, that's not quite a one-to-one -one ratio, but it's a start of uh, testing that market. And then the second piece is really construction type. As you... Uh, begin going higher, the cost is greater to, to make that, uh, that leap. And right now in this location, what uh, we're projecting as rental rates uh, didn't support further density uh, and of that nature. Thank you. Yeah. All right, other questions for the applicant or for Dustin here, Councilor Neitzer? Luke, it, it kind of looks like it has, and I don't know if this is by, looks, it reminds me in some ways of kind of like the Cascade in some ways with its underground parking and kind of a courtyard and some of its, is it gonna feel kinda like that? I think it'll feel very similar. Uh, we've selected a different architect in this project. Um, we're moving forward with Coke Hazard Architects uh, on this project. It'll have a similar feel. There's not as much retail space um, in this project, but uh, yeah. it's not on Phillips Avenue and it's, it's not as big of a site. Um, there's a lot of similarities. We've taken um, a little bit different approach in how we've designed it. Uh, it's a little more focused on smaller units, um, studios being a much stronger component. We've seen a huge uh, demand for that at the Cascade, um, and I think those uh, types of units are um, highly in demand downtown, and any housing is in demand downtown right now and um, across our city. But we've taken some subtle uh, differences here, but, uh, a similar approach in combining retail and mixed use um, along with a lot of amenities and public space within um, the project. Will the level of finish look pretty similar kind of inside and out or? Um, you know I mean outside will be very similar. Uh, some of the like wood look panels that we've provided and things uh, as well as the the light gray that shows up. Those are materials that although will be different colors um, are exactly the same as the Cascade. Um, Interior-wise, we'll offer, um, similarly, a range of different um, <laughs> finishes and levels of amenity, I guess, um, within the apartment itself. So we'll try to target uh, more simple um, units in some instances, and then, you know, some of the top floor corner units, we add a little extra um, for those who are willing to pay for those amenities sure. and finishes in their unit. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Luke. Oh, Councilor Erickson. Yeah, Dustin, question for you. Um, I know one of the things that we talked about was doing an additional appraisal after it was either surplus or, and I don't want to steal Councilor Sales' thunder because I know he's been kind of leading on that. Was there an additional appraisal done on this property? Yes, yeah, since uh, we passed the surplus <laughs> resolution a month ago, uh, we did do an additional um, appraisal for the property, which came in at, at the asking price okay. uh, or the purchase price, four hundred yeah. five hundred forty-two thousand. Wonderful, thank you. All right, any other questions? I look for a motion. Set a date of second reading for Tuesday, December seven. So move. So move. second, Jensen. Whoa, easy, everyone. <laughs> All right, motion by Councillor Sale. Uh, I think it was second by Councillor Jensen on this. Uh, any discussion here? Councillor Sale, go ahead. Uh, I'd just like to say that this project deserves a second reading, and I will say I probably drug my feet more on this than I have on a lot of things. I really don't understand how somebody can live without a car, and but I know the future is coming, and that's going to be a realistic possibility for some people long beyond me. So I urge your vote affirmative to move it to second reading, and if you have questions, they can certainly ask them. All right, thank you. Any other discussion on this one? All right, let's vote on it, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0, item 39. Right? No, we're on item 41, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> you went to the bathroom. Oh, I went to the bathroom. I got behind one. 
All right, we're on item 41. Andy, item, you're up. Item 41, a resolution authorizing the mayor to sign a bridge improvement grant BIG application resolution for the preservation or rehabilitation of various bridges in Sioux Falls. Sponsors, the mayor. Good evening, Andy Berg, Public Works. Uh, this is a resolution bringing forward uh, the ability for us to apply for bridge improvement grant or big funds. Uh, the bridge improvement program works to um, bring bridges uh, that are starting to show signs of wear back up to a high level of service before they become too deteriorated. Uh, the a grant award we got this year that will be for next year's construction was Benson Road, east of Ma uh, Minnesota Avenue over the Big Sioux Diversion Channel. That was a $3 million grant uh, to, with a million dollars a local match on that, uh, replacing bridge deck and approach slabs. This year, the two locations that we're applying for the grant funds are on North Drive to the west of the penitentiary over the railroad tracks and on North Drive to the east of the penitentiary over the diversion channel. This is more of a uh, rehabilitation project uh, where the deck will be resealed, steel rails will be redone, um, some work on the concrete barriers, and then approach slab repairs or replacements. The grant funding we're asking for is just under a million dollars with a 20% local match on these. Uh, tonight, we're asking for authorization for the submission of the application, uh, engineering request support, and your approval. All right, thank you, Andy. Anyone from the public here to speak on item 41? Council, any questions for Mr. Berg here on this item? Right. Move approval. Second, kindly. All right, motion by Selberg, second by Kylie to approve 41. Any discussion there? All right, let's vote on this one, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Jensen? Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that item passes six to zero. Mm -hmm. Move on to item 42. Item 42, a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, approving the commemorative naming designation Chris Kale Memorial Family Dock, located in an outdoor area on public property at Family Park. Sponsor is the mayor. Hey, Mike. Good evening, councilors. Mr. Mayor, Mike Patton, uh, Parks and Recreation. This item is a commemorative designation for Chris Kale, a longtime City of Sioux Falls employee of 23 years, who tragically passed away earlier this past summer. Uh, Chris was an IT specialist who supported parks and recreation as well as libraries, and I had the honor to work with him for um, many years. The, uh, it's with that understanding that the application came in for commemorative designation by his co-workers uh, with the full support of his family. Uh, this designation will honor Chris's long dedication to the city of Sioux Falls um, by, uh, boy, that's a little bit, just, by, um, uh, by commemoratively naming the fishing pier at Family Park, the Chris Kale Memorial Fishing Dock. You can see it's located just off the parking lot on the main part of the lake at Family Park. And tonight with us is Clayton Siegfried, who's going to talk a little bit about Chris's life as well as uh, the project to honor him. All right. Thanks, Mike. Good evening, Clay. My name is Clay Siegfried. I'm with the city IT department. I, Chris reported to me for the last 11 years. Um, I talked a little bit about this with the park board, um, and uh, it went pretty well, I guess. So I'll do the best I can here. But uh, on July 7th, uh, I had one of my, my last meeting with Chris directly. Um, it was a one-on-one -on -one that I had with him. It was a Wednesday. I still remember the day. And uh, many meetings with Chris that I've had over the years. Uh, he does not like meetings at all, so he really would have, would have not liked tonight's meetings. <laughs> but uh, I'll make this brief here. Um, anyway, uh, we, we did our typical 15, 20 minutes talking about work. And like every meeting that we ended, we ended at 15, 20 minutes talking about fishing. And uh, we were talking specifically about the trip that he was tragically killed the next day. And, and uh, it was it's not, it's still tough a little bit for my team. Um, hmm. we still, I still, his desk is right outside my office. Um, you know, 
Let's move on. We've hired another person and that sits in that chair and it's still a little weird seeing that individual. It's a little hard, but uh, I know my team would appreciate it if, if we could get this through. And uh, you know, the park board has been, Don Carney's team and, and Mike in particular have been great working through this process with us. But uh, you know, as far as a fit, for a memorial, I mean, the, the, the fishing dock and the, the fishing, he was, I'm passionate about fishing. He was way above what I do. <laughs> so uh, it's a very good fit for, for uh, a memory of Chris's career with the city. Hmm. So that's all I have. All right, Clay, appreciate you being here. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, just so you can see on the screen there, the proposed memorial will be engraved in a quartzite stone and placed at the entrance to the dock. Um, earlier this uh, fall, we went to the Visual Arts Commission as well as the Parks and Recreation Board, um, and they both unanimously recommended approval. Next steps in the process would be, if we're approved here tonight, we'll engrave the stone in the spring and place it. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, anyone from the public who would like to speak to this item, or is Chris's family here? <coughs> Hi, thanks, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, anyone from the public would like to speak to this item tonight? All right, council, uh, let's get a motion on the floor. We can move in any discussion on this. Move, if move second, Kylie. All right, motion by Erickson, seconded by Kylie. Councilor Kylie, go ahead. Well, I'd like to say that I'm happy to support this measure tonight, but I'd much prefer to have Chris here, as I'm sure you all would too. But it is truly my honor to support this measure tonight, and I think it's a very appropriate. So thank you for bringing it forward, and thanks to Chris's family for being here this evening, too. Any other discussion on this item? Councilor Selber, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just say pretty much the same. Um, sorry for your loss. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for being here. What a wonderful memorial. So, Other discussion, Council? All right. Let's take a vote on this, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? All right. Yes. That one passes eight to zero. Thank you guys for being here tonight. Thanks for bringing this forward. We'll move on to item 43, please. Item 43, a resolution authorizing the city of Sioux Falls to give certain surplus property to Macross and Boys Ranch, sponsors the mayor. Good evening, Kelby. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, Kelby Maris with Parks and Recreation. We have a very good and long-standing relationship with the McCrossens Boys Ranch, <clears throat> and they approached us after their uh, uh, this year's rodeo if we would be if we would consider donating these bleachers to them uh, to be used for future rodeos and other events that they have on their campus. Uh, these bleachers have been surplused and already been replaced within the park system. Uh, so this is really a win-win situation in which they can use these bleachers, uh, put these bleachers to good use, uh, and will save us the cost of disposing them. Uh, the Parks and Recreation Board did approve, uh, recommend approval uh, of this donation at their October meeting, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks, Kelby. Anyone from the public here to speak on item 43? Council, got any questions for Kelby here? Motion right. approval. Second, Brecky. Motion by Selberg, seconded by Brecky. Any discussion here? All right, let's take a vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Next item, please. Item 44, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement between the city of Sioux Falls and the Wagner Arboretum Society for the management of the Mary Jo Wagner Arboretum and East Sioux Falls historic site, including the Mabel and Judy Jasper Educational Center, the Jasper Family Gardens, and all other amenities consistent with the master plan. Sponsor is the mayor. Good evening, Jackie. Good evening, Jackie Nelson, Administrative Manager, Parks and Recreation, here to talk to you tonight about the Mary Jo Wagner Arboretum Management Agreement. So just to kind of do a little bit of a recap, um, from a timeline perspective, this agreement was approved by the Parks and Recreation Board back on October 20th. I was here last Tuesday to talk to you from the informational perspective and then tonight for City Council. 
In regard to this agreement, there are no changes with the exception of the term. So previously, this was a one-year term agreement expiring here at the end of the year. Due to the recent restructure within the Arboretum, the new executive director being Mike Cooper, we have decided to move forward with a three-year term starting January 1st of 2022 and uh, terminating on December 31st of 2024. Again, beyond the term, there were no other additional updates made, it to, made to this agreement. Uh, with that, I do have with me tonight Mike Cooper as well as Sue Aguilar, who's the Arboretum Board President, and we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you, Jackie. Thank you, guys. You spent plenty of time in these chambers over the years. Welcome back. <laughs> uh, anyone from the public who would like to speak on this one? All right, Council, you have any questions for Jackie or the prodigal son who's returned home over there? That's, that's you, Mike. <laughs> All right, I'd look for a motion then. Moved to approve, Brecky. Second, Sale. All right, motion by Brecky, seconded by Councilor Sale. Any discussion here? All right, hearing none, let's take a vote, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes eight to zero. Thank you guys for your service to the Arboretum. We'll move to item 45. Item 45, a resolution authorizing the mayor to enter into an agreement between the city of Sioux Falls and the Zoological Society of Sioux Falls for the management of the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum sponsors the mayor. So again, Jackie Nelson, Parks and Recreation Administrative Manager, uh, talking to you now about the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum management agreement. So again, similar timeline as the Arboretum, approved by the Park Board on October 20th, uh, presented at informational last Tuesday, November 9th, here tonight to talk to you um, about the agreement. So with this agreement, this was a five-year agreement that is expiring here at the end of the year. We are, it does have a current option to extend for one additional five-year term, and that is one change that is part of this agreement, is we would be exercising that option to extend for another five years. So this would begin January 1st of 2022, with the termination date of December 31st of 2026. Um, different from the Arboretum, this one does have some minor updates, um, and I would say they were pretty minor. Um, the first one being the IRS Form 990 date change from September 30th to, or from June 30th to September 30th. This is actually in Section 4.8. Uh, the June 30th was pushed back to September 30th just because of how the zoo files their taxes and does their audit. So based on when their audit results come through, They've had to uh, previously file extensions for their IRS 990. So this just puts it all in alignment with uh, how they do their financials, their audit, and then what we, what we require from a compliance perspective when I'm overseeing the agreement. In addition to that, minor languages in the back section, uh, section 15, which are really under city and society responsibilities. So the first one was in 15.1.5, adding the word browse. So browse would be food. Um, adding that the society and the city will coordinate new plantings within the zoo. That's in section 15.1.8. So again, at, with EAB and everything we're doing from a, a tree perspective or just a landscaping perspective, just making sure that when the city wants to put something in or the society wants to put something in, we coordinate to ensure we know who's taking care of what. And then finally, 15.1.16, just really defining the word exhibit. So making sure that it's clear for both parties that it means animal and informational exhibits. And with that, there were no other changes to this agreement. Right. And with me, I have Janelle Lust from the uh, zoo. She's the board chair. That would be happy to answer any questions with me. All right. Thanks, Jackie. Yep. Anyone from the public who would care to speak on this item tonight? Council, any questions for Jackie on this? Move approval. Second, Kylie. All right, motion by Selberg, second by Kylie to approve this. Any discussion there? All right, let's vote on it, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzer? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes 8-0. to zero. Janelle, thanks for your board service there. Uh, we'll move on to item 47, please. Item 47, a resolution establishing reporting structures, pay scales, and evaluations for city council appointed staff, sponsors, council members Sale and Jensen. Councilor Sale. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a resolution that directly reflects the pay increase that the general city employees got for the city council staff and appointed officials. I would appreciate your support as I believe that the people that work for us as a council do a great job. All right. Anyone from the public would like to speak on this item? 
Council got any questions or let's just get a motion on the floor, I guess. I move to approve. All second, right. Jensen. Motion by sale, seconded by Jensen. Any discussion on the council on this? Councilor Kiley? I'd just like to add a little bit to that. Not only do they do a great job, but we as counselors would not be able to do our job without their assistance. Yeah. And then any other discussion on this? All right, let's take a vote on that one, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes 8 to 0. Item 48. Item 48, a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rescheduling the business of the city from the scheduled City Council meeting for Tuesday, February 1st, 2022 to Monday, January 31st, 2022. Sponsors, Council Members Sale and Jensen. And Mayor, I'll speak to it real quick. So February 2nd is Municipal Day in Pier, at the uh, Municipal Day at the Legislature in Pier. Uh, there'll be travel and also opening events for the Council, uh, a majority of which are going that Tuesday night, February 1st. So the meeting is proposed to be moved up to Monday. All right, perfect. Anyone from the public who'd like to speak to this tonight? All right, can I get a motion to approve this move? Move to approve, sale. Second. Jensen. All right, motion by sale, second by Jensen. Any discussion here? Let's vote on it. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. Okay, that passes 8 to 0. Move to item 49. Item 49, a resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to certain citizen boards, those being Lee Jensen, Sylvia Smith to the Falls Community Health Center Governing Board, Andy Berg and Kevin Smith to the Infrastructure Review Advisory Board. Emmanuel Gutierrez, Eric Nelson, and Alan Svenis to the Public Transit Advisory Board. All right, thank you. Anyone from the public here to speak on this item tonight? All right, Council, can I get a motion here? Move approval, Jensen. Second, Erickson. All right, motion by Jensen, seconded by Erickson. Any discussion there? All right, let's vote on these folks, please. Council Member Starr? Yes. Brecky? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Jensen? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Neitzert? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Sale? Yes. All right, that passes 8-0. to zero. Council, got any new business to bring up? All right, seeing none there, we'll move on to public input. Just a reminder, three minutes per person, and on topics we didn't discuss earlier in the evening. Uh, you are up, young man. Greetings. I'm David Zokaitis, and I'm here to talk to you tonight about valley gutters. Well, what the heck is a valley gutter? Good thing I brought up some definitions. Basically, it's that dip in the road in an intersection, and it's there to move water and to uh, make the road stronger. I had my daughter volunteer, not like the way I put that, to, to draw me some diagrams of what a road looks like. So there's the crown and the gutter and the curb over there. Uh, if you're not careful when you build a road, there's a discontinuity between the road and the gutter. In this diagram, you can tell that there's a little bump and the slope changes. That turns out to be important when you make a valley gutter. And here's a cross section of an intersection. You can see that there's designed in some bumps there. Crown's kind of high, valley gutters are kind of low. And makes for a bumpy ride sometimes. There's a design problem with roads. If they're too flat and if for too large of an area, you don't get good enough drainage. And then what happens is your asphalt gets weaker and starts to crumble. Here's a picture I took near my place of a crumbly valley. Here's another photograph of a road near my place. You know, this is a, the modern era can't quite see why we design roads that you have to drive five miles an hour. I think that's a problem. And this is also a problem, also near my place. Apparently the dip was kind of severe and a lot of cars got scraped and a lot of roads got scraped. So we need to do better. So I took a look at all of these problems and all these issues and decided, well, how would we redesign valley gutters to make, to make them smoother. Well, one thing you can do is look at the drainage in your valley. If it's <coughs> sufficient, you don't need a gutter there in the first place. And some roads have really high crowns, so you could lower them. And some valleys are too low, so you could raise those up. And you could 
work with the geometry to smooth things out and make the valleys wider and get rid of some of those nasty bumps. If you have nasty bumps, you could get some precision grinding machine and make them all go away. Flatter roads are better roads. And don't forget to enjoy nature when you're driving on those bumpy roads or the smooth ones. Here's a picture I took a couple of years ago in, in Pennsylvania during this time of year. Good evening, everybody. All right, thank you. Anyone else for public input tonight? So well, tomorrow, Stacy, we have an open meetings violation that I'm gonna be with the city. And so we're gonna bring back up David's bar because we should have had public input on that and the mayor did not do that. So I will challenge it and then um, we can come up with agreements, but I am very hardcore on this. I will fight the city tooth and nail on it. I have called my attorney on it and I was advised tomorrow morning I will be doing the open meetings violation. Now we will be talking and he can smell. We're gonna be talking about David's right now. The police department, his police department had concerns about David's. We have one juvenile that was arrested for underage drinking in the bar. Okay, that's gonna be leaked out because I'm gonna finish it. Sergeant Foster had a conversation with me because it's a three-party investigation that cost thousands of dollars, Mr. Mayor. They are looking at three alcohol liquor violations on the owner and the bartender, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I have all of these that your policeman is to heads with because of the violations of the assaults happening in the bar that needed to be addressed in front of council tonight. Your officers and one of your sergeants said, Sierra, can you please address this? The aggravated assault charge is dismissed because the 16-year-old that got beat over the head with a pistol didn't want to press charges on the assailant. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, as of right now, when he's going to be charged, these individuals, and prosecuted, I'm going to ask that council do a special session, because I've already talked to Pierre about it, and revocate um, the licensure and have it go to Pierre so Pierre can revocate him and shut him down for three days. We're talking about a state charge, we're not talking about a felony here. As of right now, he has been investigated for three liquor law violations. Him and the bartender, according to Sergeant Foster. The investigation is not over, Mr. Mayor. Three parts of this investigation with this thing. So we had three different detectives on this case. Know how much taxpayers' money this has cost? To let the, the juveniles was two to three times over the legal le limit, Mr. Mayor. Is this what we want for our youth in our, in our city, Mr. Mayor? I'll be done with it for today, and then next week we'll come out with some more. But I will be filing an open a meetings violation on it. All right, anyone else tonight for public input? Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for all your time and your commitment. It's become obvious the last few weeks you put a lot of it in. My name is Chad Bishop. I live at 7405 South Valencia Drive here in Sioux Falls. Tonight I'm asking for a new policy from the city of Sioux Falls on behalf of its employees in order to set a precedent for other institutions in the state of South Dakota. The federal executive has said everything is on the table. You represent nearly 200,000 citizens, or roughly 23% of the citizens of South Dakota, so what you do here matters. An example, Army Regulation 40-562, immunizations and chemo or chemoprophylaxis for the prevention of infectious disease, 2-1-G, screening for immunity for some vaccine present preventable diseases, serologic or other tests, can be used to identify pre-existing immunity from prior infections or immunizations that may eliminate unnecessary immunizations. 2-6-A-1-B, general examples of medical exemptions include the following. B, evidence of immunity based on serologic tests, documented infection, or same, similar circumstances. Why doesn't this policy continue to apply for the COVID-19 recovered who serve in our military? 
Is it accurate to say that in a recent letter from the CDC in response to Dr. Aaron Cariotti's uh, FOIA request that the CDC admits they have no documented evidence of a single person with natural immunity getting reinfected and transmitting the virus. My request of this body is that the City of Sioux Falls preemptively state their policy of granting medical exemptions for all COVID-19 recovered persons for any future federal mandate. It has been 20 months and six days since the first case of COVID-19 was reported in South Dakota. You think all of this began, <laughs> did you think when this began, we had seen an attempt to install a regime of medical apartheid in the United States of America. Papers, please, in the United States of America. Once we learned it was the elderly, the clinically obese, and the diabetic who are most at risk, did you ever envision that we would see states require mandatory vaccination for kids to attend school, both public and private, when the vaccine has had less than a year's worth of test data? Since the CEO of Pfizer is calling folks who spread vaccine misinformation criminals, I want to be doubly sure I choose my words carefully going forward as the current regime may do his bidding. By the way, it wasn't, wasn't it Pfizer who paid out the largest healthcare fraud settlement in history with 1.2 billion of it being a criminal fine? Quoting Dr. Richard Feynman, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. In that spirit, do the vaccines on offer provide sterilizing immunity? Do the vaccines on offer prevent infection? Do the vaccines on offer prevent transmission? Do the vaccines on offer confer the development of mucosal IgA antibodies? Do the vaccines on offer? Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chad. Anyone else for public input tonight? All right. Uh, look for a motion to adjourn us out then. So moved, Jensen. Second. Second. All right, motion by Jansen, seconded by Kylie. Uh, all those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? All right, we're adjourned. Have a good night, everyone.